Number 10, King Pyrrhus. King Pyrrhus, who ruled the ancient Greek kingdom of Epirus, was also known as a brave and skilled commander, but his death at the hands of an old woman during the Battle of Argos in 272 BC was far from the glorious end. The battle took place in a narrow city streets of Argos, and while Pyrrhus was fighting an Argive soldier, he was hit on the head and fell from his horse. The Greek philosopher and historian Plotarch writes that the soldier's mother was looking down from her house, and when she saw that her son was engaging in a conflict with the king, she was filled with distress in view of the danger of her son and lifting up a tile with both her hands and threw it at the king. It is not known whether he was killed outright or merely dazed by the blow. Either way, the enemy seized the opportunity and him. Number 9, King Henry I. King Henry I of England decided to indulge in a hearty meal of lampreys, a type of fish that looks like an eel and had circular mouth filled with rows of teeth. Although Henry was fond of the fish, the doctor advised him to avoid them because according to historian Henry of Huntingdon, they always disagreed with him. Henry ignored his physician and chowed down on the forbidden fish. Soon afterwards, they caused a sudden and extreme disturbance under which his age framed sunk into a deathly torpor. Henry I is not the only king to have eaten himself to death. Adolf Frederick of Sweden managed Managed to do it in 1771 after eating copious amount of seafood and then tucking into a semla bun. Then another and another and another until he ate 14 of them and then having stomach problems and then dying. Number eight, the Duke of Clarence. The nobility was usually granted the honor of being privately executed rather than publicly humiliated, which means that their cause of death is sometimes uncertain. This is the case with George Flantagenet, the Duke of Clarence, who was executed for treason by his brother, King Henry IV. In 1478, during the War of Roses, a Rumors soon spread that rather than being or hanged, he was actually drowned in a barrel of wine. Although it may have just been false gossip, his unusual death is record in multiple histories. Fabian's Chronicle 1516, for example, mentions that Clarence drowned in a butt of Malmacy wine, maybe drinking himself to death, but suppose his death of wine gained even more traction when William Shakespeare included it in his history play Richard III, 1597. In the play, Clarence is stabbed, but then one of his, you know, killers declares, I'll drown you in wine. But wine. Number seven, King Edward II. Edward II's rule of England was fraught with controversy, much of which is stemmed from his relationship with Piers Gaveston. The nature of their relationship remains unknown, although it speculates that they were lovers. Maybe they were just roommates. Regardless, the English king's close bond with his favorite and poor leadership led to Queen Elizabeth and the nobility killing him. Many modern historians believe that he was simply left without food and water to die of natural causes. However, medieval historians claim that a hot poker was inserted into his butt to burn his bowels. Uh, in the Chronicles explains that this was also done as no apparent of any wound or hurt outwardly might have one perceived. Another account states that Edmund was killed by an assassin who hid himself in the toilet below and struck the king twice with a very sharp knife into the private parts and leaving the weapon in his butt and he fled away. Although it is benefited from his death, both Huntington and William of Malmesbury claim that it was an Englishman, Adric Sterona, who hired the assassin, and when he was sub subsequently executed for the crime, he breathed out his abnormal spirit to hell. Mm. Number six, Lady Elizabeth Bathory. Born in 1560 on a family estate in royal Hungary, Elizabeth was of noble lineage and privileged with education, wealth, and a lofty social rank. Her first taste of the morbidly bizarre was introduced to her during the early years of her life when she suffered seizures which might have been epilepsy. Treatment at the time for such bouts included feeding the patient human redness and bits of skull from a non-sufferer. She bore witness to brutal punishments and executions carried out by her father's officers and was influenced by family members involved with Satanism and witchcraft. When she was barely in the double digits of age, Elizabeth was engaged to Count Ferenc Nadasi, who she later married. Her husband spent much of his time away from home fighting the Ottomans, leaving Elizabeth to run the estate. Her Satanism became more pronounced as time wore on, and upon the death of her husband in 1601, her vicious crimes escalated. Most of her victims were girls around the age of the time she got married, and were usually the daughters of lesser gentry who had been sent to court to learn etiquette. Her favorite punishment methods including using pins to stick under her victim's fingernails and covering her victims in honey and leaving them out to be eaten by ants and other insects. Other methods included whipping her victims with nettles and frequently burning body parts, especially genitalia. After burning her victims, she would dump them in icy water. Many of them uh, were punished to the point of death, some of whom were buried in unmarked locations, and some sources even claim she engaged in people munching. 
making that her darkest secret. Elizabeth and a few of her servants were eventually arrested in 1610, and her accomplices were put on trial in 1611. With over 300 witness accounts and numerous testimonials, a guilty verdict was assured. A servant girl who claims to have seen evidence in Elizabeth's private books stated that her victims were around 650 folks. The accomplices were sentenced to death, and Elizabeth was confined to a bricked up room with slits for air and delivery of food. She was found dead a couple years later. Number 5. Marie Antoinette So France's queen between 1774 and 1792 was Marie Antoinette, who was, you know, the last queen before the French Revolution. She had quite the reputation for splurging on expensive things and found herself in quite a few scandals. One in particular was the affair of the diamond necklace. So Countess de Lamotte, a young lady, pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a high society member into believing that Antoinette loved him. She even hired a buy selling worker and disguised her as the queen and convinced the man that uh, Marie wanted to purchase a diamond necklace. The jewelry cost around 1,600,000 livres then, which is almost $12 million today. The money was never paid, and the queen had no clue about what had taken place. But even though she was innocent, the public still despised her. Granted, she's mostly known for her infamous dialogue. When French subjects could not afford bread, she said, let them eat cake, which fueled the French Revolution and ultimately led to her um, execution. Number four, Queen of Castile. So Juana la Loca was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband passed in 1506, her father buried his body. However, Juana used to open the tomb and caress her husband's dead body. And ultimately, she ordered the body dug out and kissed her husband's feet. Additionally, she would carry his coffin everywhere with her and actually kept it under her bed. Years later though, she eventually allowed his burial outside her window. Look, I just keep weird dolls under my bed. Number 3, Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg. Maria Eleonora, born on November 11th of 1599, passing eventually on March 28th of 1655, held the title of Queen of Sweden from 1620 to 1632 as the wife of King Gustav II Adolf. Coming from a noble German family, she belonged to the prestigious house of I'm not even going to try and say that. However, when Maria and Gustav gave birth to a girl with a genetic condition causing excessive hair growth, Maria was deeply shocked. The unexpected appearance of her daughter, combined with uh, societal beauty expectations, pushed Maria to her limits. She considered her daughter ugly and refused to care for what she perceived as a monstrous creature. When Gustav died when Christina was only um, this many years old, Maria blamed her for his death. For over a year, Maria subjected Christina to very harsh punishment, combining her to blacked out darkened rooms to mourn her father in solitude for very extended periods, even placing her father's open casket in Christina's room and demanding she sleep next to it. Which that's way too morbid, even by my standards. Maria's mental state deteriorated, eventually leading to Christina's removal from her custody. So thank goodness for Christina. Number two, Sixty the Dragon Lady. So the story of her rise to power is a remarkable one. Born at a time when Chinese women were politically invisible, this lady managed to acquire enormous political influence by exploiting her position as a royal concubine, engaging in court intrigues and manipulating those around her. By the end of the 1860s, she had become the most powerful individual in China. Her will and her reach even exceeded two male emperors, who she frequently bypassed or overruled. Now, she was originally born Lan Kuo in 1835, the daughter of a minor Manchu official, and at age 15, she was selected as a potential concubine for the emperor and relocated to the Forbidden City. She was elevated to the status of concubine officially by age 18, eventually giving birth to the emperor's only son, Zhechun, a feat that earned her another promotion in the palace hierarchy. The emperor died in 1861, and shortly after the disastrous Second Opium War, left the throne to his only son. So as the mother of the reigning emperor, Sixi was given the courtesy title Dowager Empress. So by this point, the empress had become quite adept at manipulation, palace intrigues, and power games. Through forged evidence and false testimony, she engineered the arrest of the eight ministers, three of whom were later executed. With the Regency Council gone, the empress became the de facto regent for the duration of her son's reign, until his early death from smallpox in 1875. The empress was instrumental in the succession, choosing her young nephew Zetian, who was crowned as emperor. So so once again, this dowager empress acted as regent to the infant emperor, this time in a more formal capacity. Twelve years into the young emperor's reign, our empress moved to the summer palace in Beijing and surrounded by a network of informants and advisors, doted on by loyalists and conservatives in the bureaucracy and military, she continued to exert enormous influence on appointments, policies, and matters of state. Stories of the empress's extravagance are prevalent, since it has been claimed that she regularly increased her personal and food allowances, uh, that she withdrew gold and silver from dwindling national reserves 
and spirited millions of pounds offshore into bank accounts in London. Other tales of her exorbitant spending include her decision to spend 10 million silver teals, uh, some set aside to rebuild the Chinese Navy, on the renovation of one of her palaces. Another rumor claims that 3,000 ebony boxes were needed to restore her jewelry collection. Number one, Agrippina the Younger. So Julia Agrippina, also referred to as Agrippina the Younger, was a Roman empress from 49 to 54 AD, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius and the mother of Nero. After the death of her first husband, Agrippina tried to make shameless advances to the future emperor, Galba, who showed no interest in her and was devoted to his wife. On one occasion, Galba's mother-in-law gave Agrippina a public reprimand and a slap in the face before a whole bevy of married women. She was one of the most prominent women in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, functioning as a behind-the-scenes advisor in the affairs of the Roman state via, you know, the powerful political ties. She maneuvered her son Nero into the line of succession, and Claudius became aware of her plotting, but died in 54 and it was rumored that Agrippina uh, poisoned him. She exerted a commanding influence in the early years of Nero's reign, but in 59 she was killed. Both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. Number 10, the oldest profession in history. Alrighty folks, we're kicking off today with a nice dose of internet no-no words, so bear with me here. If I sound convoluted, you know why. The Middle Ages in Europe witnessed a universal paradox of tolerance and condemnation with regards to the selling of one's body services. While well, technically a sin because it hinged on the act of fornication, this act was recognized by the church and others as necessary or a lesser evil. It was accepted as fact that young men would seek out sexual relations regardless of their options and thus this profession served to protect respectable townswomen from seduction or worse. In 1358, the Grand Council of Venice declared that this field was absolutely indispensable to the world. In general, declarations proclaiming the necessity of this line of work were not quite so enthusiastic. The church didn't hesitate to denounce it as morally wrong, but as St. Augustine explained, if you expel it from society, you will unsettle everything on account of lusts. So, you gotta have it. It just wasn't exactly ideal back then. Number nine, hunting witches. Witch hunters often had their suspects stripped and publicly examined for signs of an unsightly blemish that witches were said to receive upon making their pact with Satan. Now, this devil's mark could supposedly change shape and color and was believed to be numb and insensitive to pain. And more often than not, Women were both the witches and the witch hunters. And in these cases, it was easy for even the most minor physical imperfections to be labeled as the work of the devil himself. Moles, scars, birthmarks, sores, and tattoos could all qualify. So examiners rarely came up empty handed. If found guilty, witches would be sent through a series of trials and punishments, starting with the scold bridal. Also known as a witch's bridal, a gossip's bridal, a brank's bridal, or simply branks, this was an instrument of public humiliation. It was an iron muzzle in an iron framework that enclosed the head. Some exceptions were masks that depicted suffering, but not pleasant either way. Oh, you want me to elaborate? Alrighty, folks. A bridal bit or curb plate around five centimeters by two and a half centimeters in size was slid into the mouth and pressed down on the top of the tongue, often with a spike on the tongue as a compress. Ouchie. It functioned to silence the wearer from speaking entirely and cause extreme pain and physiological trauma to scare and intimidate the wearer into submission. Now, this prevented speaking and resulted in many unpleasant side effects for the wearer, including excessive salivation and fatigue in the mouth. Seeing how I've always been a chatty Kathy, I would have been sentenced to this, and my jaw ah, hurts thinking about it. The wearer was then led around the town by a leash, and for extra humiliation, a bell could also be attached to drawing crowds. It was used as corporal punishment for other offenses, notably on female workhouse inmates, and the person to be punished was placed in a public place for additional humiliation, and who knows what else. I'm sure you can put two and two together. There's things I cannot say. Number eight, bathing in what now? Aptly named the B-L-O-O-D Countess, Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman and was one of the most prolific female serial killers of her time. At the end of the 16th century and beginning of the 17th, she tormented and killed up to 650 young women at her castle in is what now known as Slovakia. The macabre nickname came from her apparent tendency to bathe in the redness of her victims as she believed it would help her maintain her youthful looking skin. I'll stick to my Epsom salts and the occasional bath fizzy. Oh, and my cleansing routines. Look, I swear my one cleanser from the ordinary might look suspicious, but it's not human redness. I just play a vampire professionally, folks. I'm not an actual one. Or maybe. Number seven, serfdom. In most Middle Ages communities, the king technically owned all the land in an area. He would lease it out to noble barons in exchange for an oath of their loyalty, and then these nobles had the freedom to govern their land and impose taxes as they pleased. Yeah, as you can expect, they were pretty brutal about it. This privilege for the few landed barons came at a great cost to the serfs. Now this was the poor mass of people who had no land and no rights. They were essentially treated as slaves by the local nobles, and they toiled on the land and brutally worked six days a week from dawn until dusk. Per the feudal system, they were forced to produce crops, raise livestock, 
livestock and offer some value, you know, to pay their liege lord for the use of the land. And the grind never ended. If you were born into the lower class, it was extremely likely you would remain there for your entire life. There was no social mobility or opportunity to work through one's birth position. Instead, the poor, unwashed masses simply kept working hard and toiling away with no chance of ever improving their lives. If that's not evil, I don't know what is. Number six, Emperor Valerian. The Roman Emperor Valerian ruled from AD 253 to 260 when he was captured in battle by the Persian Emperor Shapur I. As a prisoner of war, Valerian was subjected to humiliations, which included being used as a stepping stool from which Shapur would mount his horse. Sources vary in the description of this eventual execution, with the most gruesome tale being that he was forced to drink molten gold. An alternative story is offered up by an advisor to Emperor Constantine I, who alleged that Valerian was flayed alive and his skin was then dyed with vermilion and displayed as a warning to the Romans that they should not place too great confidence in their own strength. Although neither account is verified, drinking gold and being flayed alive are both very horrible, painful ways to go. Kind of like Game of Thrones where they poured gold on that one king. Number five, Sergurd Estenson. The first Earl of Orkney was the leader of a Viking attack on Scotland, and while few details of his life made the history books, his unusual death certainly did. Although his attempted invasion of northern Scotland in 892, he agreed to an even fight against a royal steward called Malbergut. Each leader was supposed to fight alongside 40 men, but Sergurd cheated by mounting 80 men across 40 horses. Sergurd won the battle, of course, and then tied his enemy and his head in a straddle as a, tro as a trophy. The Norse history text reports that this was actually his fatal mistake, as he was known for being a buck tooth, a particularly prominently pearly white caused a wound on his leg as he rode. The wound quickly became infected and Sergurd died. His enemy may have been decapitated, but he may have revenge in death. Number four, Emperor Valician I. Valician apparently died of a stroke after screaming in rage. Valician was a Roman emperor from AD 364 to 375 and spent much of his reign defending the borders of the Roman Empire in Europe. Valician met what a group of Quadi messengers, the Germanic people of the Romans that have been fighting for a long time to negotiate a ceasefire. The envoy maintained that the Romans had been wrong to build forts, forts in their land, and could not guarantee that all chiefs would cease their attacks. Emimenus Marcolinius, a Roman soldier and historian, wrote that Valician that burst into a mighty fit of wrath, and that he once calmed down was suddenly speechless and suffocating, and his face was tinged with a fiery flush. Valician had worked himself into such a rage that he actually gave himself a stroke. Number three, Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Qin Shi Huang unified China for a first time, after which he took the title of emperor in 221 BC and then began his process of building the Great Wall of China. Alongside these huge achievements, he was also obsessed with trying to live forever. In his attempt to achieve more mortality, his alchemist prepared elixirs for him to drink, but his habit of consuming wine mixed with honey and mercury led to his death at the age of 49. Mercury have also followed him into the afterlife as he was buried in the city-sized mausoleum guarded by a life-sized terracotta army, which supposedly featured rivers of mercury. Until his resting place was discovered in 1974, it was thought that the writings of the Han Dynasty historian Sima Qian greatly exaggerated the magnificence of his tomb, but he was proven correct about the huge number of clay figures and may also be right about the rivers of mercury. However, this will still remain a mystery until the technology is developed to enter the tomb without damaging the contents. Number 2, Duke Jing. Duke Jing ruled the state of Jin in the ancient China between 599 and 581 BC and died shortly after he abdicated due to an illness. According to the ancient text, the Zodiac Zhuang, Jing consulted a shaman after being visited by a demonic entity in a nightmare. The shaman told me that he would not live to taste the new wheat, and Jing struggled on, and when the wheat was ready to be eaten, he had the shaman killed for making an incorrect prediction. Either just before he tucked into the tasty wheat or just after, he suddenly felt the need to go to the washroom. It is unknown why, but Jing fell in and eventually drowned in a pit of urine and feces. Drowning in general in any way is a bad way to go, but drowning in excrement is particularly grim. The servant who fished his body out of the latrine also so suffered a horrible death as they were buried alive with Jing. Sucks. And finally, number one, George V. George was the grandson of Queen Victoria and was responsible for the royal family adopting the name Windsor in 1917. He had been repeatedly ill since a fall in 1915 and didn't help that he was a heavy smoker and suffered from bronchitis. By January 1936, it was evident that he was ill for the last time and his royal physician was summoned. Rather than waiting for the end to come naturally, Dawson decided the king needed to die before midnight so the news would break in the morning edition of the Times rather than less appropriate evening journals. Yeah, this guy's a, a Real one. Without the royal family's knowledge or the king's approval, he bumped him off with a lethal injection of morphine and cocaine. What's worse is that he may have struck again two years later as George's sister, Queen Maud of Norway, was visiting England when she suddenly became ill. She survived the abdominal surgery Dawson performed, but subsequently died of heart failure later after. Ominously, Lord Dawson reported to her Norwegian doctors that her death was a release, which saved her from these last painful stages of the disease, which was apparently was cancer. It's kind of giving a little Michael Jackson controversy, to be honest. Number 10, Ted Kaczynski. 
As a young man, Kaczynski was a mathematic prodigy, and at Harvard University, he underwent psychological experimentation designed to harm and humiliate subjects, which may have been part of the CIA's mind control program, aka MK Ultra, as he began to have a promising career at UC Berkeley, then suddenly resigned and retreated to the wilderness, determined to fight industrialization and the destruction of nature. Between 1978 and 1995, he mailed and delivered explosives to targets of tertiary institutions and aviation companies across the country, killing at least three people and injuring 23. The FBI dubbed him the University and Airline Bomber, leading to the nickname the Unabomber. A manhunt finally caught Kaczynski in 1996, after which he was given eight life sentences. Number nine, Henry Kissinger. Considering he was a very notable figure in American politics, his choices in regards to political American policies involving foreign affairs were extremely costly and disregarding of human life. When the Vietnam War exploded in 1955 and lasted till 1975, it had been noted that it was America's longest and most expensive war that had occurred in that era. At this time, there had been at least four noted US presidents and Henry Kissinger acted as a secretary of state for both Nixon and Ford. In regards to the conflicts between the North and the South Vietnam over the control of which mega empire would rule, this side more in Asia, whether the USSR in the North, Americans in the South, that backing that could have technically liberated the South Vietnamese was costly as it was noted to be up to another potential $700 million. But Kissinger, despite him stating in reports he wished Congress approved his call to liberate the South Vietnamese, he happened to also make deals behind closed doors with their leaders, sacrificing them for the US POW held hostage in the north. But also considering it was expensive and they needed oil, the Middle East were having conflicts after the Nakba that occurred in Palestine, how the colony Israel had taken over lands and in order for the US to get oil, Kissinger had to write to Israel to release some of the lands so they could, that they colonized back to the Arab nations so that the US could get oil to continue their war in Vietnam. But the sympathy towards the South Vietnamese dwindled not just economically but socially. When people went into the streets yelling for the government to stop funding this war, killing civilians not just the American young men forced into the war and developing PTSD later, but the hundreds of thousands of innocent Vietnamese that had also died. Kissinger had the gall to also say to President Ford in a quote, if you do that, the American people will go in the streets again, and referring to the Vietnamese, why don't those people die faster? The worst thing they can do is linger on. Yeah, he said that. As a result, the $700 million that could have liberated the South Vietnamese mysteriously was rejected by 76 congressmen into the Senate and went towards the colony Israel instead. As well as in regards to the Bangladesh Liberation War, Kissinger sneered at the people who bled for the dying Bengalis and even called Indians bastards. Hmm, nice guy. Number 8, Harvey Weinstein. For sure this guy is pretty new for the history books, but he will for sure be mentioned in law books in regarding to blackmailing, coercion, and so much more messed up stuff like physically harming and harassing women and threatening their career. As a former Hollywood film producer, he became the center of a high profile criminal case that brought attention to issues of harassment and physical harm in the entertainment industry. The allegations against Weinstein were a catalyst for the Me Too movement, a social media campaign encouraging survivors of harassment and harm to come forward with their experiences. The movement shed light on the widespread issues of misconduct and various industries, Weinstein faced a high profile trial in New York in early 2020, and the trial included testimony from multiple women who accused him of misconduct. On February 24, 2020, Weinstein was then convicted of physical non-consensual harm in the third degree and criminal act in the first degree. He was then acquitted for more serious charges, including predatory harm. Number 7, Ed Gein. Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield or the Plainfield Gowl, was an American killer and body snatcher who gained infamy for his gruesome crimes in the 1950s. His activities served as a partial inspiration for for various fictional serial killers in books and films. Gein's crime was discovered in 1957 when police investigated the disappearance of a hardware store owner, Bernice Warden. During a search of Gein's property, they found Warden's decapitated body hanging in Gein's shed, dressed out like a deer. Dressed, like skinned. Further investigation revealed a house of horrors as Gein was a grave robber who exhumed corpses from local cemeteries. He admitted to creating a variety of items from human body parts, including clothing, furniture, and masks. Gein's gruesome artifacts shocked the public so much and fueled sensationalized media coverage, and Gein was suspected in the disappearances of two other individuals, but only two deaths were definitely linked to him, Bernice Warden, and his own brother, Henry Gein. Ed Gein was declared mentally unfit for trial and spent the rest of his life in psychiatric institutions. He was then diagnosed with schizophrenia, and his confinement included time in the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane in Wapon, Wisconsin, later in a mental health institution. He was kind of inspired for that chainsaw massacre thing as well. Number 6, getting married way too young. Yeah, medieval females obtained the status of married woman very early. At the age of a girl reached the age of majority and was entitled to marry. Now, in this scheme of things, the choice of her future husband was based entirely on her parents' will. No wonder marriage sanctioned by the law of the church should not be a nightmare for many wives. Under civil law, a husband was permitted to moderately physically harm his wife. Actually, a medieval tradition advised a husband to treat his wife as a pupil. So, like, teach her her place. 
So a lot of desperate women therefore uh, killed their husbands. The legislation of those times had detailed regulations governing punishment for women who had killed their husbands. They were sentenced to death by burning alive or burning at the stake. Kind of like a witch. Creative, but not really. Number 5. Have more than 10 offspring Yes, I know this can be a touchy subject, so just bear with me here. I'm not calling giving birth evil by any means, or having multiple offspring by choice evil. I more mean that back in the day, it was a woman's job to essentially reproduce as many offspring as possible to help around the home and to continue on the family name. As somebody who has zero interest in ever reproducing, and that is my personal choice, I have many friends who have, and I will be a fantastic aunt, the thought of giving birth once is terrifying, never mind that often. I read about a lady who had 17 offspring, and sure, while some of those might have been multiple births, I can't even imagine the pain. Or also just raising that many little ones, being responsible for that many little ones, the stress, no thank you. All the props to them, but evil because they were forced to, not because they wanted to. Number 4. Take up the waste After that last one, let's start this point with a fun fact, shall we? So the British word for toilet, loo, derives from the French garder l'eau, with meaning, you know, watch out for the water. Gardez l'eau, je parle français. <laughs> this comes from the fact that, well, in medieval Europe, people simply threw the contents of their chamber pots out of the window onto the streets. Now, before throwing the waste out of the window, they'd yell, Gardez l'eau. The term Gardez l'eau first came to English as Gardez l'eau, and then shortened to Lou, which eventually came to mean the toilet itself. People in the Middle Ages were no less sensitive to foul odors or disgusted by human waste than we are. They also didn't understand exactly how human waste could spread disease, but they knew it, you know, did. They just thought it was something to do with its odors. And hey, while we're on the topic of hygiene, in the early Middle Ages, women passionately cared about personal hygiene. Many townspeople took a bath, and there were a lot of bathhouses in towns. But due to the total victory of Christianity, life kind of changed. With all bathhouses being public, the church viewed it as a violation of moral standards. So then they closed them, and then untidiness was elevated to the level of virtue. Look, I'm a bit of a Christianity hater, so I'm just gonna leave that one be. Number three, V-Day traditions. So during medieval times, they believed that if a young woman ate strange food on Valentine's Day, she'd dream of her future husband. And in a time where normal meals were delicacies such as a boar's head sewed onto a turkey's body, these weird meals were, well, extra weird. The roasted hedgehog was just one of the bizarre foods that these young women would enjoy in hopes of seeing visions of their future Valentines. Yeah, okay, because that's gonna make me gag. How about we do a little palate cleanser before we move on to the next bad thing? So other sayings that were popular at the time was if you saw a bluebird, you would marry a happy man. If you see a gold finch, you're gonna marry a millionaire. And if you see a sparrow, you're marrying a poor man. If you find a glove on the road on Valentine's Day, your future beloved will have the other missing glove. Now by the 18th century, gift giving and exchanging handmade cards had become common practice. In England, handmade cards incorporating lace and ribbon became popular. And eventually this form of gift spread to the American colonies and into our traditions today. Also, it was found to be terrible luck to sign your name on a Valentine's Day card. And the superstition must have been very confusing for some folks, but convenient for others. As well as cards and flowers, the next gift to become popular was the giving of chocolates. And this can be traced back to Richard Cadbury of, yes, the famous chocolate-making family, who invented the first Valentine's Day candy box. Now, as those grew in popularity, chocolates started to be given in decorated boxes filled with, you know, romantic imagery. I remember my first boyfriend got me a box back way back when was a box of chocolates. I think my mom still has the box because it was a really pretty box. Number two, institutionalized. Okay, folks, back to the icky stuff. Being sent away was a way to impose a pious life of no ownership or wealth, sexual relationships, any devotion to God, and administer health care and alms to the most unfortunate in society. In reality, it didn't always work. It was a way of kings, lords, and earls banishing troublesome wives, you know, just to get them out of sight, out of mind. They could even do it to uh, young that they didn't want to have around. Just a way of cleansing the soul, if you'd like. Hey, look. If we're looking at like the upside, a woman from aristocracy only had two options in life. Marry a man who could support you, or join a nunnery. Now, virginity was an integral requirement for a nun in the very early medieval period, because physical purity was considered the only starting point from which to reach spiritual purity. A nun was expected to wear simple clothing as a symbol of her shunning of worldly goods and distractions. The long tunic was typical attire, with a veil to cover all but the face as a symbol of her role as a bride of Christ. The veil also hid her hair, which had to be kept cut short. Nuns could not leave their nunnery, and contact with outside visitors, especially men. That was kept to an absolute minimum. No temptation here. Granted, life isn't perfect. There was a couple of little scandals. I know there's one in mid 12th century where at the Gilbertine Watton Abbey in England, a lay brother had a sexual relationship with a nun and on discovery of the sin was castrated. It's kind of a common punishment of the period for that type of crime. Can we bring it back? Not for cheating, but for bad things. Number one, take care of the monthly visitor. As someone who's currently dealing with my regular monthly episode of cramping and being a miserable 
which hell women had to deal with this in history before modern products is very much evil in my book. So it was very much a vastly different experience than it is today. To start, medieval women had fewer periods than today's women. Poor nutrition and hard work meant that they had very low body fat, and a woman needs to have some sort of it or her reproductive system slows down and menstruation ceases. In our modern words, for example, a medieval woman could use a makeshift, you know, pad or tampon. Pads are made of scrap fabric or rags, hence that's where the phrase came from. Cotton was preferred though, because the material absorbs fluids better than the alternative, which was wool, which is also like itchy and uncomfortable. There is some archaeological evidence to show us that some women may have worn panty-like garments, and they could also wind cotton fabric around a twig, and uh, you make of that what you will. Interesting side note though, a common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England. Now the long official name I can't say, but the popular name was B-L-O-O-D moss, and people realized that they could use it in the battlefield as first aid. So you know, put two and two together. Also, the main reason why uh, medieval petticoats came in red, it was fashionable, decorative, but it was good at disguising accidents. Simeon Robespierre. It is pretty well known conception when it comes to the French. Riots, p protests, and petitions and revolutions are pretty coherent. Every time the citizens of France are pissed off about something, you can guarantee they'll be on the streets and ready to go. But when did this start? Well, in 1789, when King Louis XVI needed more money, he failed to raise taxes, and when he had called a meeting with the state general, a man named Maximilien Robespierre came about after he was inspired to become a political advocate for the revolutionary cause. Especially since the fact that he defended the will of the people with such conviction that he was nicknamed the incorruptible at the time. But as always, when it comes to political leaders, that title can only last for so long. Because the idea and title of being such a sudden spokesperson for the people entered his head, he concluded that those who opposed him also meant opposing the people, which again wasn't true. Just because you're a spokesperson for the people doesn't mean you represent all the people. As political leaders and representatives, your role is to listen to the people even if individually they criticize you. You still need to take into consideration for effective leadership. And although we can get into the deeper details, eventually after hundreds and thousands of people died and successes of committees and policies, the Republic was still in danger as Maximilian com commented on criminals disguising themselves as patriots. In summary, the use of the guillotine was used about 16,594 times, and in the end, victims of the massacres were noted as they were caught in the crossfires of the patriotic bloodshed. In the end, his quasi-dictatorship obsession came to the end when he himself, Maximilian, was also guillotined. Number 9, Beverly Allett. Uh, like all ordinary people, it all starts with a specific moment in time where a switch is flipped and you no longer see yourself as the bad guy, or if there's a sense of self-awareness, maybe you do know, but you just can't stop. In the cases of Beverly Allett, she was actually always into the idea of taking care of somebody. And when she was young, she had the tendency to practice medical stuff, like play a nurse or do gauzes and cast. But it wasn't in a form of, oh, I want to learn how to be a nurse. It was more so of like, hey, I'm hurt. Can you pay attention to me kind of thing. Even to the point the obsession and desperation of being paid attention to would lure her to causing inflictions onto herself and then convince her own doctor to even remove her healthy appendix. She then left school and at 16 took a course in nursing as this was in 1968 so everyone was just doing things very early on. And as soon as she finished her course however she got into a hospital and in 6 months of hell, specifically over a period of 59 days, she would harm and kill over a dozen children. Every child under her care would suffer from cardiac arrest, chest pains, life support and insulin overdose. The sad part was, because she was a pediatric nurse, people trusted her fully with their children, thinking she was taking care of their kids but after staff grew skeptic of another child's death, that's when they found out she had access to drugs and eventually led to her arrest. When she was being interviewed, she apparently laughed, smiled, smirking that she wouldn't go to jail. But justice prevails, and as on May 1993, she was sentenced to life in prison. Number 8, James Patterson Smith. When it comes to toxic relationships, this is an important note that there are sources out there when you don't know if you are in one, and as well as another note, if you feel like the person has to hurt you to love you, I'm going to tell you right now that is not what that is. Find people who care about you, and if it got physical, just call authorities. In the case of Kelly Ann Bates, she was unfortunately groomed by James Patterson Smith when she was just 14 years old. She was babysitting for friends, and Smith had an odd impact on Kelly, but what's more odd was that he was 45 years old. A 45 year old man was hitting on a 14 year old. And when Kelly tried to introduce him to her mom, she was livid and she said, Kelly, this man is bad and not a good man and hair would actually rise at the back of her mom's neck. She was right, after four weeks straight, Kelly would be tormented, harmed, attacked and be left with injuries so extensive that when they found her drowned body in the bathtub, authorities know it was something they just haven't seen before, especially how her eyes were gouged out. Prosecutors noted that the trial had in quote, it was like Smith was trying to deliberately disfigure her, causing her the utmost pain, distress and degradation. The injuries were not the result of sudden eruption of violence, but a torment that caused over time. They eventually noted that Smith was delusional and had a distorted reality with paranoia and morbid jealousy. It only took the jury only one hour to sentence the man to life. Number 7. Basil Zaharoff 
When it comes to a good salesman, from what I've been told from friends who used to do door to door or do retail and the require of commissions, they always tell me that it's about human connection. And as for Basil Zauerhoff, he was viewed as a master of bribery and corruption. Considered as the mystery man of Europe, you're looking at the most important people of the time when it comes to influencing the political scene in Europe with his arms deals. On both sides, he would actually sell weapons where he'd be dubbed merchant of death. He didn't care which side he was selling to just as long as he was selling, after all considering the current times, war is a business. Not even at the expense of civilians or human life as a whole, to men like Basil, they only care about money. Even today, despite his transactions, they remain a mystery as he took up two days burning as much evidence as possible. After the First World War, he wanted more money and focused on the conflicts in Greece where he single-handedly convinced both parties between Venizelos and King Constantine to use his weapons against each other. He was basically playing sims, but in real life. In the end, his life was shaped by seizing opportunity wherever he could find it, and through his self-serving businesses dealings, he helped shape the power dynamics of Europe and thus played an instrument part in the history of the continent. Number 6. Clementine Barnabet Clementine Barnabet was an American woman who gained notoriety in the the early 20th century for alleged involvement in a series of death in Louisiana. Barnabet claimed to be a member of a religious cult led by her father, Raymond Barnabet, and she asserted that the cult believed in cleansing the world by killing those that seemed sinful. Between 1911 and 1912, a series of brutal axe deaths occurred in Texas and Louisiana, and Barnabet confessed to being involved in some of these killings. In 1912, Clementine was arrested along with her father, two brothers, and the connections of these deaths. She confessed to her involvement in the crimes, claiming that she and her family were carrying out God's works, killing sinners. It was a job. Barnabet but confession came under scrutiny as some believed it might have been coerced or influenced by her father, but uh, there were also doubts about the accuracy of her statements. And uh, regarding the number of victims and her role in the killings, Clementine Barnabet then went to trial for her alleged um, involvement in the crime. In 1913, she was found guilty and sentenced to prison, and her father and brothers were also convicted, but more of a lengthy sentence. Clementine Barnabet spent the rest of her life in prison and was never released, thankfully. And the circumstance surrounding the crime and remains a controversial and still unsolved or unresolved. Number five, Jeffrey Epstein. I know a lot of folks know this man is a greedy, nasty, rich jerk who lived in a vile organization, allowing other rich, nasty folk to take advantage of the young and vulnerable. But as the ringleader of a trafficking and harming of young women everywhere, apparently in 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to state charges in Florida for soliciting and procuring a person under 18 for adult work, meaning under 18, young adolescents, like the age of 12 or 14. He then reached a plea deal that allowed him to avoid federal charges and served only 13 months in jail. This lenient deal orchestrated by the then US attorney Alexander Acosta later then became a subject of public scrutiny. Which as it should, considering why is the US so lenient on crimes on young people? Like people that the law should protect. And then finally, 10 years later, after who knows how much more damage and crime he's committed, in July 2019, federal prosecutors in New York arrested Epstein on trafficking charges. They accused him of exploiting and abusing dozens of underage girls, and the arrest following the unsealing of a new indictment, but by then 2020, somehow he died in his cell. Some say he took his own life, and others, well, when it comes to controversy, that they didn't want him to talk. After all, the nature of his relationships and the extent of his activities fueled public outrage. He wasn't alone in this, after all, he needed someone else to lure these young underage individuals. So, Ghislaine Maxwell, you know her, was also charged and arrested. Investigations into Epstein's activities and the circumstances surrounding the 2008 plea deal continued. Legal actions against his estate and those connected to him remain ongoing, reflecting the broader effort to seek justice for their victims. Number four, Joseph James Delangelo. Joseph James Delangelo, also known as the Golden State Killer, is an American serial killer and caused this YouTube, because I gotta be very discreet, physically violated people, if you know what I mean, who terrorized, Cal uh, who terrorized California in the 1970s and 1980s. D'Angelo's crime was initially attributed to several monkeyers, including East Area Harmer and original Night Stalker, unlike Richard Ramirez, another serial killer and vile man. His crime initially began in the Sacramento area before spreading out to other parts of the state. D'Angelo's modus operandi included breaking into homes, often targeting couples, because he was just jealous. He would tie up and harm the victims, committing non-consensual harm and then theft. In later crimes, he escalated to killings, earning him the nickname the Golden State Killer. The, the case remained unsolved for decades, but advancement in DNA technology played a crucial role in solving it. In 2018, investigators used a public gene genealogy website to identify distant relatives of the suspect and eventually led them to Joseph James D'Angelo. D'Angelo was arrested on April 24, 2018 at his home in Citrus Heights, California, and he was identified through DNA evidence and genealogical research. At the time of his arrest, D'Angelo was also, get this, a former police officer, which added to an extra layer of shock to the case. In August 2020, D'Angelo was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and the sentence marking the conclusion of one of the most notorious unsolved criminal cases in US history. Number three, Nathan Bedford.
Bedford Forrest. What a name. There's so many interesting names on this list. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a prominent Confederate general during the American Civil War. Unsurprisingly, given his culpability in the Ford Pillow Massacre in April 1864 and the formation of the Triple Ks, Forrest and his image may have come under attack by many sectors, especially from African Americans. The Triple Ks embarked upon a campaign of intimidation and violence against Southern blacks and Republicans until Forrest ordered the organization to disbanded in 1869. Nevertheless, the local chapters of the Triple Ks continued to be active and Forrest was ordered to appear before congressional hearing in 1871 and his sometimes contradictory testimony he denied he ever had membership in this organization yeah you're He's the one who had the receipt. A combination of age, exhaustion, and conversation to Christianity may have caused the Forrest's fiery temper and racial attitudes to his moderate and later years. Number two, Samuel Little. Apparently noted the most discreet but also most vile crime committing killers. The reason why he was able to get away with over killing 93 women was because of the time or the height of these deaths. Majority, if not all of these women were women of color who worked as adult workers. And because in the 70s, law enforcement didn't prioritize people of color or the occupation of working as an adult worker, any case of missing persons from both of these factions as a cohesive was met with dismissal. So Samuel, who had a blood thirst for control and death, committed to these crimes only to these main demographics and even admitted that once he was caught at a homeless shelter in Kentucky, originally the arrest was over narcotics, but while they tested DNA, they found the link to his crimes that were left as cold cases. And he actually memorized all of the victims that he had killed. That's crazy. Number one, Raymond Valden Lahare and John Heller. These men are hella messed up and I'm not surprised, but it's also known that, um, yeah, that's pretty much why these guys are on this list. Specifically Raymond, he was a doctor who, re who ran a research study to learn about the effects of syphilis on 400 African American men, also supposedly also 600 African men around that range. The study began in 1932 and in the 1940s the cure of syphilis was discovered in penicillin. As a result, during the experimentation, the doctors didn't tell the patients they had syphilis and didn't even give them a cure. Even some of the subjects who have heard about penicillin, so the doctors gave them sugar pills and said that they were cured when they weren't. They even prevented 50s era public health campaigns to cure syphilis from an operating in their area and they told patients that the painful spinal taps and other procedures were free treatments. They did not allow patients to see any other doctors just in case those other doctors would cure them and mess up their so-called research. Many of the patients were drafted for World War II and the military wanted to cure their syphilis and recruit them, which the researchers fought as best as they were able to and the study finally ended in 1972. By that time, 128 of the men have died from syphilis and the rest have been treated by military while they were drafted. Many of the children were born with syphilis related related birth defects and more than that born dead. The last victim of this gross and horrible experiment, also known as the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, was Ernest Hendon, who died on the 16th of January 2004. According to Fred Gray, a lawyer who represented victims of the study of the federal lawsuit, eventually in the courts as well as the study of the law of the case brought to wild attention of the three that were unethical of the study. Evidently, the rights of the research subjects were violated. The Tuskegee study raised a lot of host of ethical issues such as informed consent, racism, patronism, unfair subject selection in research, maleficence, truth telling, and and justice, among others. The gross part that even though the research helped reduce syphilis, John got an award for it, despite the traumatizing things that he had done to the patients for life. Number 10, Dracula. The man, the myth, the legend, Vlad the Impaler. This dude was so down bad, he was the inspiration for Dracula. There's really only one reason why he was so evil, and honestly, it's in his name. Vlad the Impaler liked to impale people, oftentimes alive. As if this was the worst thing thought up by a human being ever, he would leave the pikes on display, creating a horror only the eyes of medieval Europe could see. There's gonna be a lot of bad dudes on this list, some really saucy villains, unsavory characters who will make your skin crawl, but only Vlad has been bad enough to get a monster inspired by him, essentially turning his actions into somewhat of a spooky mythology. Dude gives off some serious goth energy. There's a few portraits of him, but if you look at it, he's got this stare in his eyes, like, like he wants to impale me or something. Vlad be nimble, Vlad be quick, just wait till you see his sharpened sticks. Number 9, the guy everyone knows. Look, YouTube won't let me say his name, but do we really have to? I mean, it's Mustache Man. Infamous for his bad art and lame book, he was the fascist leader of Germany. The very same leader who forced the world into World War II. Remember that one? Yeah. He's the very same monster who organized the destruction of Jewish peoples in Europe, and if he had his way, probably the whole world. I wouldn't be surprised if you showed a picture of him to anyone on Earth, any country, rich or poor, and they will most likely know who that was. That's the kind of evil that will get you talked about in classes all over the world, and likely for a long time. 
Eventually, he got what was coming to him, and the world had peace and prosperity, and there was never ever another bad stinky war ever again. Why is he not number one, you might be asking? Well, that's just because his numbers don't compare to others, which is a very troubling statistic. I'll get to that later. Number eight, busy man. Most people on this list are not going to need any introduction. Genghis Khan is no exception to that. The Mongol warrior king saw his nomadic empire stretch thousands of miles, being one of history's largest empires. If you've been paying attention in history class, and you should have been, don't skip class or Big Ched will put you in the naughty corner. But yes, that's right, I just referred to myself in the third person. Speaking of third person, that's how many people Genghis unalive in his bloody conquests. Oh, did I say three? I actually meant a lot. Did I say a lot? I actually meant a disturbing amount. Some people like to point out that he was accepting of other people's cultures and beliefs. Yes, that is true, but that's after he burned down the village right before he got to yours, and you got forcibly assimilated into his numbers. As you can also imagine, a bloodthirsty barbarian like him did not treat women with much respect. It's Kangas Khan, man. That's that's just how it do be. Number seven, so long, Bowser. Ivan the Terrible. Okay, sure, Vlad was called the Impaler, but you can kind of take that a different way, right? Not in that way. All innuendos aside, with a name like Ivan the Terrible, it's kind of hard to work around that. Even as a child, Ivan was showing traits of an evil dictator, or supervillain really, as it's said that he would throw animals off of tall roofs in the same way that Mario throws Bowser off of platforms. Becoming the first Tsar of Russia, and probably its worst, he's responsible for many horrors and crimes, but the most infamous being his responsibility for his own son's demise. After a heated argument regarding his unborn grandson, and in a binding fit of rage, Ivan claimed his son's life. Sure, dads get angry when sons don't help mow the lawns or help take out the trash, but that's going a little far. One minute you're having a fight with your dad, and the next minute you're being carried out by Ghani and pallbearers. You know, the dancing guys, the memes, the casket, you know? Yeah, it's a joke. Number six, Brenda Spencer. I Don't Like Mondays is a song by Boomtown Rats and a famous quote by our favorite cat, Garfield. But for the 16 year old Brenda Spencer, who the song Boomtown Rats is based off of, is one of that's very concerning. Brenda Spencer had killed two adults and wounded eight children in a sniper attack on a San Diego elementary school in 1979. The reason, she said, it was just because she didn't like Mondays. And she had a very specific color that she liked and if you were wearing it that day, you were shot. Her parents were separated when she was young and she was left in the custody of her dad. And her father did try to bond with her after noting she had a knack for shooting birds with a BB he took on himself to get her a semi-automatic. Why? I don't know either but he could have just taken her to like the mall or something. But apparently according to Brenda, she said the reason why her dad got her the weapon was because she knew he, she was depressed and there was rumors that she wanted to take her own life. The morning of the event that took place is when her separated father left home and she was supposed to be at school, but it was noted by her teachers she had no interest in academics. And so she lived next to an elementary school and when she saw the children and the adults around, that's when she fired. Eventually further casualties were reduced when the police moved a van that obscured her vicinity and she was eventually apprehended. After a deep psych valve, she was pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 25 years to life. Number 5, Candence Elizabeth Newmaker. When you grew up in an unstable home, there are cases, if not most cases, especially if the child is unable to have any rehabilitation of security or sense of safety. The child, psychologically speaking, is for the lack of a better word, traumatized. After Candace Elizabeth Newmaker's parents were caught for their negligence of Candace and her siblings, Child Protective Services took her away. As a result, she was later adopted by a single woman and a pediatric nurse named Jean Elizabeth Newmaker. But after months of adoption, Candace was reacting pretty not good and she was very aggressive, according to Jean. She was even she even killed her pet gold fish and started playing with matches. Keep in mind this was all under the allegation of Jean as she would also give Candace medication and take her to a psychiatrist due to her reckless behavior. In the year 2000, Jean took Candace to a pseudoscientist by the name of Cornell Watkins who didn't have a license to do a two week intensive attachment therapy program that cost $7,000. She found this so called psychiatrist from another licensed psychologist named William Goebel. After two weeks, Candace died from the so called rebirthing session and the goal of this so called rebirthing required an individual, in this case a child, to mimic a simulate womb covered by flannel sheets and pillows. Candace was held down by four adults where she was begging and pleading that she couldn't breathe. She yelled 11 times that she was dying to which the people involved named Julie Ponder said go ahead and die right now, for real. After 20 minutes, Candace threw up, excreted inside the sheet and despite, they still restrained her. 40 minutes after, they asked her if she wanted to be reborn and she responded no. They yelled at her that she was a quitter and at the end of the session she realized that she was motionless, her fingertips were blue and Jean, who was watching the session from another room, took notice and tried to do CPR. 
They called 911 and when they were able to get a pulse, but eventually Candace died from a, from being brain dead from asphyxia. Considering this was all videotaped, these so-called therapists were sentenced to prison sentences, convicted of reckless child harm. And after that, the U.S. House of Rep passed Candace Law in Colorado and North Carolina, preventing reenactments of the so-called birth experience. Number four, Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie was also known as Madame LaLaurie, who was a New, New Orleans socialite of French Creole descent who lived in the 19th century. She was infamous for her association for one of the most notorious instances of cruel and harm in American history. So reports suggest that slaves who were owned by Delphi were found in a state of extreme physical harm and torment as reportedly chained to walls. Others were confined in small cages and others shown signs of severe mutilation. The exact details and extent of the atrocities vary in historical accounts, with some describing brutal experiments and inhumane treatment. As the news of the discovery spread, a mob of outraged citizens attacked the mansion. However, Delphi and her family managed to escape before le facing any legal consequence. Of course. After leaving New Orleans, Delphi's exact fate is unclear as there are different accounts of where she went and what happened to her. The Lori Mansion has also been noted as a haunted house as ghost stories and legends as it's also considered to be one of the most haunted places in New Orleans. Number three, HJSY. If you were in Japan in the 70s, you might know this horrific and tragic story of Junko Furuta. A once motivated, popular, and beautiful high school student was headed home to watch the final episode of her favorite television show, Tonbo. When suddenly, four deviant horrible high school boys by the name of Hiroshi Miyano, Joe Ogura, Shinji Minato, and Yashishi Watanabe adopted, adopted her and took Junko to Minato's home. There, they were extremely violent as they violated her and allowed other men to violate her as well. From the day of her kidnapping on November 25th to the day that she died on January 4th, under excruciating physical and psychological pain, she was tormented, beaded, lacerated, and even burned. Her appearance drastically deteriorated to the point where she even gave off a rotting smell. After beating and dropping an iron exercise ball on her stomach several times, burning her with hot candles and on her eyelids, forcing her to drink her own urine, Furuta succumbed to her injuries and she died. Less than 24 hours after realizing she had died, they wrapped her body in blankets, shoved her in a body and traveling bag, then placed her body in a 55 US gallon drum and filled it with wet concrete. They then dumped her body in a cement trunk in Tokyo and after they were caught and convicted for another of kidnapping and physical harm to another woman, the boys accidentally confessed to the crime of Junko and told police where to find her body. She was finally found and her parents and her classmates and her co-workers found peace knowing she can finally be buried. But these horrible crappy kids were only able to get less than a 10 year sentence and even the mother of one of these horrible delinquents, Ogura, vandalized Furuta's grave saying that the dead girl ruined her son's life. Which to be honest, after these guys were released, they ended up doing more crime anyway and got arrested for that. Either way, the tragic crime of Junko Furuta had echoed as one of the most horrible crimes committed in Japan. Number two, Gamal Pasha, also known as executioner of the Armenian genocide alongside other members of the CUP. During his tenure, Jamal Pasha implemented policies that would lead to the mass deportation and killing of Armenians. He is implicated in the forced marches, massacres, and other brutal actions that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Armenians. Pasha was also a key figure in the executions of genocidal policies set forth by the Ottoman government. And after World War I, Pasha fled the Ottoman Empire and sought refuge in Germany. In 1922, he was assassinated by an Armenian revolutionary named Telehiran. Tehilaran was later tried and acquitted by German court, which recognized the massacre of the Armenians as a war crime. So that's good to know, you know, the German court can recognize genocide as a war crime. Pasha's role in the Armenian genocide is remembered as one of the part broader historical narratives surrounding the events of 1915 and 1923, during which the Ottoman Empire systematically targeted and killed a significant portion of Armenian population. The genocide remains as a historical debate, with Turkey officially de denying the term genocide to describe these events. However, many countries and scholars around the world recognize that this was a genocide. Which, if anything, any nation that has the audacity to eradicate a nation of people by displacing them, cutting off their water, killing hundreds and thousands of their children, obliterating generations of family trees, and literally committing violence on civilians is a war crime. It is a genocide. Finally, number one, King Leopold. Although he's a king, a lot of people seem to not know that the trauma inflicted this so-called king had as a significant role in Congo. Congo had suffered his horrible and vicious rule as Leopold acquired control over Congo's free state as his private property during the time when European powers were competing for territories in Africa. While officially presented as a philanthropic and humanitarian venture, Leopold's administration in the Congo was marked by exploitation and brutality. From forcing them by using methods of extracting resources that were often brutal, involving the use of violence, mutilation by cutting off their hands and feet by making them also stare at their lost appendages, and forced labor of the Congolese people. The atrocities committed during this period had been well documented with the estimates of death toll ranging from several hundred thousands to millions. The harsh exploitations along with the disease introduced by outsiders led to significant decline of the people of Congo. 
Villages were ravaged and families were separated, contributing to the long-lasting impact of Congolese society. But was King Leopold ever accountable for his actions and his crime against the Congolese people? No, of course not. He was a European king and like all colonizers, they always seem to get away with it. Even right now, Congo is going through a massive genocide as they are forced to mine for natural resources and minerals like cobalt for your cell phones. 70% of the world's cobalt for laptops, jet engines, rockets, cameras are all from the mines in Congo and who's mining them? Children. In 1996, over 6 million have been killed and half of them are children. As there are currently 6.9 million people have been displaced, these crimes in Congo since Leopold still remain and the tech industry are deeply complicit in the injustices in Congo. Number 10, Julia Tofana. In the 1600s, women who were left under the control of malignant husbands who would physically end harm and control them was a rather common issue. And the general rule was that unless your spouse passed away, that was the only time a woman could be granted her freedom. The active contents inside the vial with the artwork of St. Nicholas were unknown. Known, but mostly it was filled with arsenic, lead, and possibly belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and therefore easy to mix with other many other substances like wine or water. It was called by the name Aqua Tofana, and it was named after the suspected Julia Tofana as she was the main distributor and ringleader of this secret sauce. The actual creator might have actually been another woman who was caught later on. The poisoning of Aqua Tofana would go unnoticed as its symptoms would mimic other illnesses that were prominent at the time. First dosage would mimic a cold, the third dosage digestive issues, and the fourth was death. It was so effective and helpful that when the poison was used in a slow active state, it would give the victims the assumption that they were dying and would write a will and repent. And if the provider of the poison changed their mind, the antidote was simply lemon juice and vinegar. Although the invention of this poison substance was eventually discontinued as so many had been caught with the subject, it lasted for the length that it did due to the assumption that it was a cosmetic, when really it was for women of this time a vial of liberation and freedom. Number 9. Vladimir Demikov A very famous Soviet scientist scientist by the name of Vladimir Demikhov was known for his innovation, organ transplants, which had saved many lives in the medical world by extending life from near-death events. However, how he came to this is just as disturbing and concerning as it was revolutionary and innovative, and he would transplant a number of vital organs between dogs. But then he decided to experiment even further by suing together a two-headed dog. He and his assistants would attempt to operate not just a few times, but over 24 times to create a functioning two-headed dog, and it was at the 24th time it was widely publicized. It was even featured on Life magazine and unsurprisingly was considered a very dark, horrifying creation that had been beheld. He sewed together the head of a neck of a small dog named Shavka onto the neck of a large stray German Shepherd named Broad Yaga. The mad scientist created an unnatural creation at a disturbing cost. For the surgery itself, Demikov amputated Shavka the lower body below the four legs, keeping her heart and lungs connected until just before the transplant. Then he could attach Shavka to the upper body of a corresponding incision of Broad Yaga's neck. The operation lasted three and a half hours, although both could function and here Shafka ended up dying as she was not attached to Brody Yaga's stomach so whatever she ate fell out. And tragically, the two animals died four days later due to the damage of a crucial vein. The previous pair of dogs lasted for a month before they too died in a fatal end. And Vladimir also had no intention to stop his animal cruelty experiments and would continue trying until his death. Number 8, MK Ultra. Project MK Ultra was an illegal human experimentation program designed and undertaken by the CIA and intended to develop procedures and identifying drugs that could be used during interrogations to weaken people and force confessions through brainwashing and psychological torture. MK Ultra used numerous methods to manipulate its subjects' mental state and brain functions such as a covert administration of high doses of psychoactive drugs and other chemicals without the subject's consent, electric shocks, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual and other forms of torment. MK Ultra was preceded by Project Artichoke and it was organized through the CIA's office and coordinated with the US Army's biological warfare labs. The program engaged in illegal activities including the use of US and Canadian citizens as unwitting test subjects. Investigative efforts were hampered by CIA Director Richard Helms' order that all MK Ultra files be destroyed in 1973. The Church Committee and Rockefeller Commission's investigations relied on the sworn testimony of direct participants and on the small number of documents that survived Helms' order. In 1977, a Freedom of Information Act requested uncovered a cache of 20,000 documents relating to MK Ultra, which led to Senate hearings, but some of the surviving information about MK Ultra was declassified in 2001. Number 7, Philip Zimbardo. An American psychologist and a professor at Stanford University was known for his involvement, leadership, and administration on the research of the Stanford Prison Experiment. He was heavily criticized as the experiment was seen unethical and scientific reasons. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a psychological experiment conducted to stimulate a prison environment to examine the effects of situational variables on participants' reaction and behaviors. Participants were recruited from the local community with an ad in the newspaper offering $15 per day to male students who wanted to participate in a psychological 
study of prison life. Keep in mind, $15 back then is roughly $114 today. Volunteers were chosen after assessments of psychological stability and then randomly assigned to being prisoners or prison guards. Over the following five days, psychological harm of the prisoners by the guards became increasingly brutal. After psychologist Christina Maslach visited to evaluate the conditions, she was upset to see how study participants were behaving and she confronted Zimbardo and he ended the experiments on the sixth day. The SPE had been referenced and heavily criticized as an example of an unethical psychological experiment as a hardum inflict on the participants in this and the other experiments in the post World War II era. Because of this experiment, it prompted American universities to improve their ethical requirements and institutional review on human experiments to prevent them from being similarly harmed. The goal of Zimbardo's primary reason for the conducting of the experiment was to focus on the power of roles, rules, symbols, group identity, and situational validation of behavior that generally would repulse ordinary individuals. But with one positive result of the study is that it altered the way the US prisons are run. For example, juveniles accused of federal crimes are no longer housed with before trial with adult prisoners due to the risk of violence against them. Number 6. The Mad Doctor I love doctors. Shout out to the people working in the medical field right now. I appreciate you. I couldn't even imagine the horror that is medical school though. We all know my track record for reading, and hours upon hours of studying would just be bad for my health. I gotta squeeze more video game time in there, it's just how I work man. However, one doctor I would not want to cross is Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. He is most likely the inspiration for a lot of horror movies. A serial unaliver said to have been performing surgeries on animals at a young age. Which, again, doing some freaky deaky stuff to animals as a kid is like the red flag of red flags. It's like the only red flag. If that wasn't enough, he used to steal cadavers from the university he was studying at and and doing all kinds of not nice things to them, not naughty, bad. Having a clear obsession with medical practices and anatomy probably was helpful in disposing of his victims. And like something from Tales of the Crypt Keeper, that's exactly what he did. He constructed a large house, or building really, with trap doors, secret tunnels, and a lot of rooms. A basement where he could dispose of his victims. He would later then open this house of horrors up as a hotel where unknowing people would come to meet their doom. Yes, it's Tales of the Crypt Keeper! <laughs> Come check in to the Hotel of Doom! Number 5. Bad Comrade Stosif Jolin was the leader of the Soviet Union for probably too long. A man who worked his way up the political chain until general secretary meant leader, which if you look it up, it's kind of crazy. That itself is a crazy story. He's responsible for a great loss of life. It is estimated in the range of 40 million people. Ooh, yikes. Most spooky evil dudes usually go after an enemy to someone they consider to not be part of them. He did do this, but a lot of his own people sadly met their ends from the Red Menace too. Organized and deliberate purges of people and famines to starve people. It's safe to say he is and was and always will be one of the worst humans to ever walk the face of the earth. To put it in perspective, Jolin's son was a soldier in World War II, and after being captured by German forces, the Germans thought they had one on the bus. Heck, this was a get out of jail free card, right? Well, when a prisoner trade was proposed by the Germans, Jolin laughed at only how an evil communist could, and denied the trade. His son would later perish in a POW camp shortly after. What a monster. You think you trade with me? Ah, keep them, I don't want. Number 4. Fine White Powder Oh to be in Miami in the mid 1980s. If I had one wish, it would be to spend a summer night in the neon soaked beaches of Miami under strict laws enforced by a president who didn't know what was going on right underneath his nose. If you were around back then, then you probably got to experience something like that. Or at least in my fever dreams. I hope so. But as much as I'd like to be Tony Montana with all that sugar on his desk, I know it's bad for my health. Speaking of bad for your health, Pablo Escobar. I know, that's where I went with that. Probably the most ruthless criminal ever to live on planet Earth. Pablo was a poor man born in a poor country, but ended up being one of, if not the richest man on planet Earth. His lucrative distribution of adult sugar in the 80s made him very wealthy. It also made him very dangerous, as he was willing to do whatever to get his way. Extortion, bribing, bombing, just about anything you can think of. Oh yeah, he was one bad dude. He had so much money that he had to bury it all all over Colombia. Every once in a while some of his buried treasure pops up. And as much as I want a quick million in US cash, I'll just put it back where it came from. Oh Dios mio, lo siento Pablo. Number 3. Al Capone 
another ruthless criminal, and honestly, Capone walked so gangsters like Pablo could run. Part of the ruthless Italian mafia that was the outfit, Capone worked his way through the ranks during 1920s Prohibition America, earning millions in his time where really just $100 could stretch a long way. Capone is noted for his violent behavior throughout his life and the many accidents accidents he caused directly or indirectly. Prohibition and the Depression were hard times for a lot of folks in America. However, the media and the people of Chicago at first always wanted to see what the lavish gangster was up to, as his criminal life became somewhat publicized, most likely due to his wealth. The dude was rich. He eventually would get arrested and sent to Alcatraz, which was probably the worst prison in America, or the best Call of Duty Zombies map, depending on how you look at things. I look at things through a Call of Duty way, so eh. Number two, Gavrilo Princip. That might not be a name that you're familiar with, but it was the man who unalived Franz Ferdinand, which started World War I, which caused World War II, which caused the Cold War, which caused the collapse of Soviet Russia, and it's why you live in a post-war globalist world with markets developing rapidly in the cyber world. Except maybe the whole thing in Ukraine, watch out for that. Kinda crazy to think how all that could come from one wrong turn and a guy seizing an opportunity. But this also means he's kind of responsible, in a way, for all the bad stuff that happened in those times as well. So maybe don't seize the day? I'm not sure. Just, just don't be ruthless criminals, guys. Watch our videos instead. Although I could blame them for failing my math test in high school. Yeah, we'll go with that. Number one, Mao Zedong. I'd like to come out here and tell you all about the chairman of China, but that simply is just too hot for TV, and if it's too hot for TV, it's too hot for YouTube. Basically, he was the dictator of communist China and is responsible for many lives lost. It's estimated to be somewhere in the range of 60 to 80 million people. Whoa. <laughs> Dude was down bad, the definition of down bad, and although many were told to adore him, there's still a great many people who remember the terrible things he's done. From Beijing to Hong Kong, there's not a person around who doesn't know who he is. If being a no good rotten person was an Olympic sport, he would have gold medals coming out of his ears. Number 10, Stubbins Firth. Stubbins Firth was a University of Pennsylvania researcher fixated on one particular scientific scheme and a various dangerous one at that. As a trainee doctor, he became obsessed with the idea that yellow fever was non-contagious, to the extent that he went to great extremes trying to prove it. Armed only with a trusty blade and his incessant desire to find the truth, first sliced, opened his arm and smeared vomit from yellow fever patients into his wounds. When that made no difference, he poured the vomit into his eyes, drank some of it, fried the stuff, and breathed in the fumes. And in a final act of madness, he covered himself with blood, urine, and saliva from infected patients. Ultimately, Firth proved this theory so far as he didn't get sick. However, we now know that this was as much down to him making samples from the late stage patients who were past the point of contagion. In other words, Firth swallowed infected vomit but didn't shred much new light on the disease. So he did all that. For nothing. Number 9, Jose Delgado. University of Madrid graduate Jose Delgado may have received a prestigious professorship at Yale University, but his research was on dealing with mind control. While at Yale in the 50s, 60s, Delgado inserted electrode implants into the brains of primates and used a remote control that gave off radio frequencies to make the animals perform complicated movements. Later, he placed the implants into the brain of a bull and got into the ring with the beast using his transmitter to stop charging before it reached him. Aside the animal cruelty, he even tried these experiments on 25 people and wired them up. Behaviorally, it only induced the people's anger and impacted more towards their aggression, but he kept striving for a way to achieve mind control and even once said, we must electronically control the brain and someday armies and generals will be controlled by electric stimulation of the brain. I don't know, I guess it doesn't work. Number 8, Paracelsus. Switzerland Paracelsus' contributions to taxology were based heavily in astrology and he is quite no well known for offering the community a wide array of useful ideas and innovations. He was a pioneer in several aspects of the medical revolutions of the Renaissance, emphasizing the value of observation in combination with received wisdom. However, for all of his use, he also thought he might be able to create a homunculi, or small humans, who stood no more than a foot or so height and performed actions very similar to Gollum. Not Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but pretty close. He is said to have run away after turning on their master. The homunculus creation used bits of people using semen and hair. To him, the fully grown homunculi was supposedly greatly skilled in art and could create giants, dwarves, and other marvels as though they are art 
they are born and therefore art is embodied and born in them and they needed to learn it from well no one well it didn't end up working because they ended up dying uh, right away number seven Peter Nobor clinical psychologist led by Peter Nobor ran a secret experiment in which they separated twins and triplets from each other and adopted them out as singlets the experiment said to have been partly funded by the National Institute of Mental Health came into light when three identical triplet brothers accidentally found each other in 1980 they had no idea they had siblings and David Kelman one of the triplets felt really angry towards the experiment quoting we were robbed of 20 years together said Kelman in the Orlando Sentinel article his brother Edward Gallen sadly took his own life in 1995 at his home the child psychiatrist who headed up the study Peter Nober and Viola Bernard showed no remorse according to news reports going as far as saying they thought that they were doing something good for the kids separating them so that they could develop their own individual personalities as wrote Nober learned from his evil experiment that anyone's guess as a result of the controversial study are being stored in an archive at Yale University and they say they can't actually reveal it until 2066 number six Valeris and Perilios of Athens throughout history humans in general have created an enclave of many extraordinary things and as civilizations go for some reason in our distant past they had an obsession of creating agonizing means and the inflictions of others Perilous of Athens had created something that at first glance may seem like a work of art but its uses had been a thing of torment the brazen bull the beautiful bronze statue casted in ancient Greece was invented between 570 and 554 BC the statue was actually commissioned by the reign of Phalaris an evil tyrant in Sicily so many would think that he's actually the real inventor or more or less had the idea this tyrant was also known for eating new babies as his new cruel torment device and the bull was cast hollow and was used as a fire would be built below and its design was that it would be opened and a person would be forced inside the fire would start underneath the person and it would burn as the smoke and steam would escape from the bull's nose incense was placed inside to counteract the smell of burnt flesh and it is said that it was a series of tubes built inside the statue to design to distort the screams of the victim and make them sound like an animal Phalaris was a piece of work as he wanted to test the sound system of the bull that he even pushed Perlios the man who created the bull for him into the belly and lit a fire under him and then he later released him before he pushed him off a cliff but by sheer karma Phalaris died in a bull himself as the city was taken over by Telemachus in 554 BC number five Lytle S Adams after hearing about the vicious attacks of Pearl Harbor on the radio Lytle S Adams developed a unique plan of vengeance against the Japanese Imperial Army with the bat bomb the bomb consisted a bomb shaped casting over a thousand compartments each containing a hibernating Mexican free tailed bat with a small timed incendiary bomb attached dropped from a bomber at dawn the castings would deploy a parachute in mid-flight and open a release of bats which would then disperse the eaves and attics in a 20 40 mile radius Adam stated that the bat was the lowest form of animal life and that until now reasons for its creations have remained unexplained he went on to espouse that bats were created by God to wait this hour to play their part in the scheme of free human existence to frustrate any attempt of those who dared desecrate our way of this life this weird device was then of course proved by President Roosevelt who's remarked that his friend wasn't crazy but the idea was worth looking into Either way, after the conducted of a few tests, the program was eventually canceled after it was estimated a use of two million, or in today's value, $32 million was wasted on this invention. When it comes to war, humans showcase the worst of the worst if it means of expanding their nation's political planning. And if you're in the military, there's an internal conflict to fill in your nationalism and your internal duty to serve the country, and you forget your economical issues. When it comes to the invention of war, as it has been showcased throughout history time and time again, even in current unfortunate events, the creation led to genocide by means of invention of different kinds of warfare. Developed by Fritz Harber, who was a professor at the University of Karlsruhe was a brilliant chemist who invented the industrial scale productions of ammonia based fertilizer. Alongside Frederick Guthrie, the two was noted as the ones who weaponized and synthesized a Vescant chemical warfare agent called mustard gas, a widely used weapon used during World War I by both sides of the conflict with particularly harmful and deadly effects. It was responsible for the 1,205,655 non fatal casualties and 91,198 deaths. The effects ranged from minor symptoms such as skin irritation and conjunctivitis to of severe lung damage when inhaled. Despite the horrific use of mustard gas during World War I, there was a silver lining, the discovery of the first modern chemotherapeutic agent based on observations of World War I survivors exposed to mustard gas. The studies eventually launched an era of cancer chemotherapy research. Number three, Oliver Winchester. An American businessman and politician named Oliver Winchester was best known for his founding manufacturing the marketing of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, AKA the Winchester Rifle. The first official Winchester rifle was a model in 1866. Repeating rifles was not widely used until after the war when they became increasingly popular with the civilians. Military authorities concentrated primarily on perfecting breech loading single shot rifles for many more years. His ownership was then passed to his son who died of TB and his wife Sarah Winchester ended up moving to California with the inheritance as she began to make the famed 
Winchester House, a haunted mystery house due to her fear of spirits being murdered by the rifle. Number two, Dow and Company. Originally developed to simply enhance the growth of soybeans, Agent Orange was weaponized and used extensively during the Vietnam War. During the war, Dow, Monsanto, and other companies were compelled by the U.S. government to produce Agent Orange under the U.S. Defense Production Act of 1950. Used in large quantities, it was a powerful herbicide used by the United States to deforest the jungles and destroy Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army crops. The United States military sprayed upon up to 20 million gallons of herbicides over Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia from 1961 through 1971, covering over 4.5 million acres. Agent Orange was often proven afterwards to cause very serious health problems for both Vietnamese people and returning U.S. military personnel and their families. Among were rashes, birth defects, and severe neurological problems, as well as cancer. This military action has caused the nation of Vietnam since then. The country has reported over 400,000 of their people were maimed and killed by the harm of the herbicides that 500,000 of their children have been born with birth defects caused by the exposure of Agent Orange. The U.S. courts, of course, have constantly ruled that Dow and other manufacturers bear no responsibility for the development and the use of Agent Orange during the Vietnam War and have dismissed all legal claims to the contrary. And finally, number one, Oppenheimer. An American theoretical physicist and director of the Manhattan Project Los Alamos Laboratory during World War II is often called the father of the atomic bomb, causing the destruction and devastation of the Japanese as it resulted the tragedies of 200,000 civilians and military personnel. The ethics of these bombings and the roles in Japan's surrender are subjects of debate. Oppenheimer did important research of the theoretical astronomy as well as the quantum field theory and the extensive of quantum electrodynamics. But with his interest that led him to the development of these weapons still hold to this day dire consequences on the lives that it would affect. In a very famous quote to this recognition, he has said, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once in the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. Now I have become death, the shatter of worlds. In a meeting he had with President Truman, he was distraught at the invention as it was now readily usable at the hands of practically anyone. And President Truman was infuriated at Oppenheimer when he said, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. Responding that he, Truman, bore sole responsibility for the decision on the atomic bomb against the Japanese, which later Truman said, I don't want to see that son of a bee in this office ever again. The Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons aimed to reduce the spread of nuclear weapons, but its effectiveness has been questioned. Modernization of weapons continue to this day. Bombs alike have been proved with its massive casualties and results to devastation, eradication, genocide of innocent people, and the tragedy of wars it inhibits in our modern times. Number 10, Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth Bathory, commonly referred to as the Blood Countess, occupies a pretty creepy place in history as a Hungarian noblewoman with a notorious reputation. She is believed to be one of the most prolific female serial killers in history, earning her eerie nickname from the gruesome practice of bathing in the red red of her victims. This ritual was apparently rooted in her belief that it could preserve her youthfulness, and it sounds like some pretty extreme anti-aging to me. Operating during the late 16th and early 17th centuries within the walls of her castle, now located in modern day Slovakia, Bathory subjected an estimated 650 girls to unimaginable horrors. Her reign of terror reached its thankful end on December 30th, 1610, when Elizabeth along with four accomplices faced arrest following an investigation into the disturbing rumors surrounding her actions. Despite the severity of the accusations though, a lack of concrete evidence prevented the claims from being substantiated. However, the absence of solid proof did not grant her leniency, and she was confined to her castle until her eventual passing. Her evil deeds and the whole blood-soaked castle deal make her a heavyweight in the true crime scene. It's a legitimate horror story with more questions than answers. Would probably make a great horror film though. And in at number nine today is Ma Barker. Ma Barker, a notorious figure in US criminal history, served as the leader of the feared Barker gang, which her sons were also a part of. Gaining the title of the FBI's public enemy number one, Barker orchestrated a series of robberies, murders, and kidnappings across the American Midwest in the early 1930s. Her life came to a pretty explosive end in 1935 during a prolonged standoff in her Florida hideout, setting a record as the longest standoff in FBI history. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI's first director, once described her as the most vicious, dangerous, and resourceful criminal brain of the last decade. Hoover's description added to Ma Barker's mysterious reputation, solidifying her reputation as one of the most evil women of all time. Number 8, Belle Gunness. Belle Gunness holds the disturbing title of one of America's worst female serial killers. Even before considering her terrifying actions, she was already an imposing and physically intimidating woman, standing six feet tall and weighing over 200 pounds. It was alleged that she was responsible for the passing of her husbands, younglings, numerous suitors, boyfriends, and even her own daughters, Myrtle and Lucy. Belle's motive was pretty simple. 
greed. She gained income by stealing life insurance and assets from her victims. Reports suggest her victim count exceeds 20, with some claiming it could be over 100. Inconsistencies in her post-mortem examination, such as the reported height being two inches shorter than Belle's six feet, contributed to her becoming a figure in American criminal folklore, often compared to a female bluebeard because people will make things up and just run with it sometimes. Number seven, Griselda Blanco. Born in 1943, Griselda Blanco, known by her aliases of La Madrina, or the Black Widow, emerged as a frightening figure in the criminal underworld. Hailing from Colombia, she etched her name in history as one of the most ruthless and feared queen pins ever known. Blanco's notoriety reached its peak as a key player in the notorious Medellin Cartel, a criminal empire synonymous with violence and illicit trade. What sets Blanco apart is her unexpected role as a mentor to none other than Pablo Escobar. However, as fate would have it, their relationship eventually soured, paving the way for a rivalry that would echo through criminal history. Blanco's criminal empire revolved around the transportation of a certain illegal powdery substance from the fields of Colombia to the streets of the United States. This calculated operation, coupled with her alleged involvement in up to 200 people being ushered to the pearly gates, showcased Blanco's audacity and cunning in a male-dominated realm. Her ability to not only navigate but dominate such a perilous environment proved her prowess as a criminal mastermind. Following a stint behind bars, Blanco's life met a chilling end on September 3rd, 2012, when she was wiped out in a hail of lead, leaving a void in the criminal landscape she once ruled. I'm all for girl power, but uh, let's just put that energy somewhere else, shall we? Cool. Number six, the Burke and Hare. Body snatching was very common in the ages of the pre 19th century, as the only legal way to get bodies for dissection was those of executed criminals. Since it was difficult to get on the waiting list for these bodies, anatomists took burying bodies from the grave, robbers, or even doing it themselves. Up until the students and the anatomists would carry out their own raids in graveyards, acquiring cadavers as and what they could, William Hare and his friends William Burke found ways of delivering fresh corpses to their boarding houses without actually having to steal a body, which is that they would smother more than a dozen lodgers at that boarding house. House. And then they would sell their bodies to the anatomist Robert Knox. And Knox didn't notice or care that the bodies that he received were recently fresh, as it was imperative to his job. Burke was later charged and died for his crimes, and the case spurred the British government to loosen the restrictions on dissection. The scandal led to the Anatomy Act of 1832, where they made a great number of cadavers legally available for education purposes. Typically, these bodies would be from those who died in an asylum and had no relatives or any ways to cover for funeral costs. Number five, Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb was in charge of the CIA's MK Ultra project in the 1950s. This project's goal was to investigate techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit to anything. I guess in some ways it's kind of like the truth serum but with psychology. More specifically, he too also wanted to find a way to do mind control like Delgado in number 9. He wanted to find ways with the CIA to induce the behaviors of enemies, but in these cases, Sidney went his way to buy dosing unsuspecting subjects with LSD, experimenting with illegal drugs and sought out all sorts of exciting ways to poison people, including Fidel Castro, as he is the man behind the infamous poison cigar. If you guys know Stranger Things, the suspicion of Eleven getting her powers was from her mom being induced with LSD chemicals that were thought to be creating of powerful abilities, but unlike Stranger Things, it definitely helped open someone's mind up, but not like moving stuff with one's mind. Number four, Sergei Burko Honeko. Although he's been credited with helping bring about the most important advances with open heart surgery, his gruesome act was at on experimentations on animals, also animal cruelty. Sergei wasn't content with slicing up animals after they died, more specifically, not only did he not like to wait, but he also didn't like the animals to die, even after they've been decapitated. In the late 1930s, him and his team undertook a series of experiments as part of which they removed a canine's head and kept it alive away from its body by hooking it up to an air and blood supply apparatus. He would also have another hound had all the blood drawn from its body, only later to be brought back to life by the Soviet Frankenstein. Number three, Shiro Ishii, a microbiologist and a lieutenant general of Unit 731, a biological warfare unit of the Imperial Japanese Army during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Ishii is remembered as the father of biological warfare. Under his watch, thousands of captives were infected with deadly diseases and thousands more were impacted by chemicals on the battlefield. Ishii performed a bunch of experiments that had nothing to do with chemical warfare including force of actions, vivisections, and simulated strokes. Huh. Humans were also used as a living test cases for grenades and flamethrowers, and prisoners were injected with inoculations of diseases disguised as vaccinations to study their effects. Because life is totally fair, Ishii was never charged with war crimes, and he died peacefully at his home in Japan in the late 60s. Number two, Joseph Mengele. Mengele gained notoriety chiefly for being one of the SS physicians who supervised the selections of arriving transports of prisoners, determining who was to be killed and who was to become a forced laborer, and for performing human experiments.
comments on camp inmates, amongst whom Mengel was known as the Angel of Death. Mengel was just a stone cold killer as he performed experiments on 3,000 sets of twins and less than 30 survived his depraved antics. His experiments included, but sadly were not limited to, dyeing children's eyes to be a specific color since he has an obsession with monochromatic eyes, sewing twins together to make them conjoined, and giving them gangrene. In fact, many of his evil deeds weren't scientific at all. He was just masochistic. He was reportedly smiling every time he took part of his selection process of sending arrivals at camps on who were unfit for labor straight to the gas chambers. He died in 1976 and as he was never brought to justice for his crimes. Number 1. J. Marion Sims Although he was known as the father of modern gynecology, Sims was gained much for his fame for doing experimental surgeries on slave women. Sims remained a controversial figure to this day because the condition he was treating the women, viscogenital fistula, caused terrible suffering. Women with fistulas, a tear between their private parts and their bladder, were incontent and were often rejected by society. Sims performed the surgery without anesthesia, in part because anesthesia had only recently been discovered, and in part because Sims believed that operations were not painful enough to justify the trouble, which is what he said, but still regardless, the cruelty he bestowed on these women were not at all consented and manipulated the social institutions on slavery to perform human experiments, which by any standards is unacceptable. It might be too clever to talk about Lizzie Borden as a pun, but I'll ask you guys about that later. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, Lizzie Borden was an American woman who was tried and then later acquitted for the axe murderers of her father and stepmother in Massachusetts. Lizzie was very religious and would go to church and do church activities, teaching Sunday school, etc, etc. Three years later, after her mother passed away, her father remarried to Abby Gray. Lizzie didn't like Abby that much because she suspected Abby's goal was her father's money, and as tensions grew, even more when Andrew would gift real estate to his new family's wife and their stepmother received a house. The night before the murder, their uncle visited their father to discuss property transfer, which placed more tensions. After the crime was committed, the police turned their attention to Lizzie as she gave conflicting testimonies within the day. And after many, many strange occurrences, like her cleaning her dress and burning it up, saying it was covered in paint, the town's suspicion of her drugging her father to sleep in order to whack him with an axe, overall the evidence was unclear and caused many controversial issues. However, the trial was later pushed away when another axe murderer, similar to her father and her stepmom's case, occurred five days prior. Still, the reputation of Lizzie and her sister's involvement was tarnished, and the suspecting evidence and accounts of that day remains unsolved. Number 9. Elsa Koch Elsa Koch was a German war criminal who committed atrocities while her husband, Karl Otto Koch, was commanded at the Bolchenwald in World War II. Because of the egregiousness of her alleged allegations and her actions included that she had selected tattooed prisoners for death in order to fashionably create lampshades and other items from their skin. I don't, these are fake by the way, they're not real. Her 1947 US Military Commission court trial at Dachau received worldwide media attention as did the testimony of survivors who ascribed her sadistic and perverse acts of violence to Koch giving rise to her image as her concentration camp murderesses. However, authoritative testimony from numerous witnesses at her post-war trials firmly established that she had made extensive use of slave labor at the camp, had assaulted inmates on several occasions, and had reported inmates to the camp SS for beatings. Beatings that resulted in death on at least one occasion while imprisoned, she experienced delusions and had become convinced that the concentration camp survivors would abuse her in the cell. She then ended up taking her own life in jail while serving time. Number 8. Belle Gunness With an estimated 48 deaths at her hand, Belle Gunness poisoned, bludgeoned, and decapitated her victims, all so that she could collect and line her pockets with savings and insurance policies. This lonely hearts killer was known as Lady Bluebeard, amongst other names, luring her victims with newspaper advertisements. Gunness then began meeting wealthy men through a lovelorn column. Her suitors were her next victims, each of whom brought cash to her farm and then disappeared forever, including John Moo, Henry Galthart, Olaf, Oli B, Andrew, just to name a few. One of the victim's brothers came suspicious, and Gunness's luck seems to be running out. Her farmhouse burnt to the ground and the smoldering ruins workmen discovered four skeletons, three were identified as her foster young, however the fourth, believed to be Gunness, was unexpectedly missing as its skull. After the fire, her victims were unearthed from their shallow graves around the farm, all told the remains of more than 40 men and miners were exhumed. However, Bell managed to skip out of town before being officially convicted and was never tracked down. Her death has never been confirmed. Number 7. Countess Elizabeth Bathory I don't know if you've seen the tales of Snow White and how there was this once evil queen who yearned for eternal beauty, but like all fairy tales come from the stem of truth. Countess Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman who was an alleged serial killer from the family Bathory, who owned a land in the Kingdom of Hungary. Bathory and four of her servants were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of young and old women between 1590 and 1610. During her arrest, it is commonly believed that Bathory was caught in the act of the torture, but the reality was that she was just having dinner. Most of the witnesses testified that she had heard the accusations from others, but did not actually see it themselves. The servants confessed under torture, which is not credible in contemporary proceedings. The accusations of the murder were based on rumors, and as there is 
no documents to prove that anyone in the area complained about the countess. In this time period, if someone was harmed or let's say someone stole something, a letter would be written out as a complaint. Several authors have argued that Elizabeth Bathory was a victim of conspiracy. Similar, during the Salem witch trials, many people insisted that they saw the accused witches of flying through the sky. Clearly, neither thing happened and are possibly a form of mass delusion or self-interest lies. Historians are therefore extremely careful in how they treat eyewitness accounts of this sort, given the possibility for collective and self-reinforcing delusions. Number 6. Christiana Edmonds Christiana Edmonds, also known as the Chocolate Cream Killer, was an English woman with a really disturbing hobby. She would purchase chocolates, lace them with strychnine, a powerful and toxic chemical, and then return them to the shop. Unexpecting customers who brought those chocolates would naturally fall ill. In 1871, a tragic incident occurred when a young person passed away after consuming one of the poisoned chocolates. Now, Following this, Edmonds escalated her campaign by sending parcels of her dangerous chocolates to notable individuals. As the police began linking the fatal and damaging outcomes to the chocolates, Edmonds attempted to deflect suspicion by sending parcels to herself in order to mislead the police. How intelligent. Once she was caught, Edmonds was initially sentenced to death, but her punishment was later changed to life imprisonment due to her mental illness. Number 5. Mary I of England Born on February 18, 1516, Mary I held the throne as Queen of England and Ireland from July 1553 until her passing. As the only surviving child of the marriage between Henry VIII and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, Mary I's reign is notable for her brutal persecution of Protestants, earning her infamous moniker, Bloody Mary. Her attempt to forcefully return England to Catholicism resulted in the forced passing of numerous prominent Protestants, contributing to a climate of fear and leading around 800 Protestants to flee the country, unable to return until her passing. During her reign, Bloody Mary implemented the Heresy Laws, which resulted in the burning of over 300 Protestants accused of heresy. Despite the widespread violence, Mary I was never prosecuted for her actions. However, after her passing on November 17, 1558, the winds of change swept through England, ushering away from her staunch Catholic policies. The efforts to re-establish Catholicism were ultimately reversed, marking a turning point in the religious landscape of England. Mary I's reign entwined with religious strife and political turmoil remains a complex chapter in history where power, ideology, and the consequences of persecution shape the course of a nation. Number 4. Wu Zetian between 665 and 690, Wu Zetian controlled China as empress through her husband, and later as empress dowager through her sons. However, in 690, she achieved a historic milestone by becoming empress, marking her as China's first and only official recognized female ruler. Wu Zetian maintained her authoritarian position from 690 until her passing in 705. Now, Despite the significant achievements in expanding China's territory and establishing it as a power Powerful empire, her reign was unfortunately also marked by violence and bloodshed. Wu Zetian's rise to power was marked by a series of manipulative and ruthless tactics. She orchestrated the downfall of her political rivals, resorting to schemes such as false accusations, purges, anything to eliminate potential threats. While her success in building a powerful empire is acknowledged, she has faced enduring criticism for the ruthless tactics employed to do so. Number 3. Mary Ann Cotton Mary Ann Cotton, who lived in the 1800s, left behind a criminal tale that's not all neatly documented. Back then, record keeping wasn't the greatest, so we're left with a bit of a puzzle when it comes to the exact details of her evil actions. But it's estimated that Cotton might have offed around 21 people. Three of them were unlucky husbands, and a whopping 11 were her very own family. She had this not so friendly habit of using arsenic to bring their lives to an end, and then cashing in on their life insurance policies. The party came to a screeching halt however, when she attempted this method on her stepson, Charles Edward Cotton, leading to her capture and the grand finale, a date with the executioner. Now, here's where it gets interesting. They gave her a short rope, instead of the customary long one. This meant that instead of physics causing her neck to snap, she instead suffered a long, slow, agonizing suffocation. Number 2. Mary Piercy Mary Piercy, born in 1866, lived in Kentish Town, North London, with her lover, Charles Creighton. Feeling unsatisfied with life, at the age of 24, Mary sought more, leading her to become romantically involved with a man named Frank Hogg. However, it seems that Frank, 
was also already spoken for, being already married to his pregnant wife, Phoebe. The dark events unfolded on October 24th, 1890, when a policeman discovered the almost severed body of a woman in Crossfield Road, Hampstead, along with a blood-stained pram. Mary's association with the crime drew attention when she displayed hysterical behavior at the mortuary while viewing the body of the deceased woman, later identified as Phoebe Hanelo, Frank Hogg's wife. The next day, the lifeless body of Hogg's daughter was found near Finchley Road, a mile away. This time, the cause was suffocation. As the police became more and more aware of the affair between Frank and Mary, they searched Mary's house and found broken furniture and bloodstains. Mary, seemingly unfazed, played the piano and sang loudly during the search. The police ended up uncovering an axe, two knives, bloodstained clothing, and love letters between the illicit couple. Mary's attempts to explain the stains as a result of taking out mice was met with understandable skepticism. The police gathered evidence from neighbors who had witnessed Mary wheeling a pram away from the house on the evening of October 24th and heard screams from her residence. The disturbing truth emerged during the trial at the Old Bailey in December 1890. Mary's defense claimed insanity, but it proved unsuccessful, resulting in her sentencing to be sent to hell. On December 23rd, 1890, at Newgate Prison, Mary Piercy faced execution by hanging orchestrated by James Barry, just over a decade after her father, Thomas Wheeler, met a similar fate for a similar crime. I guess it kind of runs in the family. Number one, Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie, who, Delphine LaLaurie was a prominent New Orleans socialite who lived during the early 19th century. She's infamously remembered for her role in one of the city's most gruesome and horrifying scandals. Born Mary Delphine McCarty in 1787, LaLaurie married three times and became a central figure in New Orleans high society. However, her reputation took a pretty dark turn when her mistreatment of people that she kept forcibly endured came to light. Reports of extreme cruelty and sadistic practices circulated, revealing the disturbing treatment of servants within the LaLaurie mansion. In 1834, a fire at the mansion exposed a hidden chamber where individuals were discovered in appalling conditions, subjected to unimaginable horrors. The shocking revelations sparked public outrage and Delphine LaLaurie fled the city, leaving behind a legacy of cruelty that continues to haunt the historical narrative of New Orleans. Number 10, the Donovan family Ouija board. In the eerie case of the Donovan household, we witnessed the harrowing consequences of uh, dabbling with the supernatural. Patty Donovan's innocent curiosity led her down a treacherous path when she engaged with, yep, a Ouija board, the thing I hate the most, believing she had found a friend and a spirit. As she grew emotionally dependent on this entity, the disturbing incidents began to unfold. The malevolent spirit, once her confidant or boyfriend, turned into a malevolent force, turned into quite the force wreaking havoc on her family. It targeted their vehicles, disassembling engines and puncturing tires, leaving them vulnerable and stranded. The spirit's actions escalated with vandalism around their home and inexplicable damage to their property, even to the point of furniture levitating and rocks raining down on their house. It's kind of baffling that the family didn't connect the dots sooner, seeing as the signs of, you know, chaos became increasingly apparent and obvious. Her dad, Ted Donovan's desperation, led him to seek help from our favorite paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Upon their arrival, they sensed a pervasive malevolence within the home, and the family's history with the Ouija board was finally revealed. The Warrens, realizing the gravity of the situation, initiated the process for an exorcism, which took a painfully long month to be granted. In the meantime, the entire family endured more torment and destruction at the hands of the malevolent entities. Finally, on May 2nd, the exorcism took place, liberating the family from their demonic ordeal. However, they were left with a substantial financial burden due to the extensive damages inflicted upon their home. Let this be a lesson to you all. Please, please, please leave Ouija boards alone. Police. Number 9, the Woodruff family. So this incident happened in St. Francisville, Louisiana, and in a home built in 1796 by General David Bradford on top of a formal burial ground, so um, brace yourselves! Our story begins with a newly married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Clark Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff was a cruel and harmful man and owned numerous slaves, which was the icky norm at the time, and one in particular that he liked to um, punish went by the name of Chloe. Now, Chloe tried to protect herself from the wrongful punishments by listening in on the Woodruff's conversations and modifying her her behavior, which Hey, that's brilliant. Sadly though, one day after being caught eavesdropping, Clark had one of Chloe's ears cut off. The painful experience would stay with Chloe and inspire her to make plans for revenge. On the ninth birthday of the Woodruff's daughter, Chloe placed poisonous oleander leaves into the cake, intending to only get the family sick so she could nurse them back to health and, um, you know, earn a favor with the family. Tragically, the dose was lethal, and it ended up killing the misses and the offspring. Now, while Chloe was punished fatally by the other slaves and her ghost haunts the home, the mirror in the front hall is cursed and has the spirits of Sarah and her two descendants 
descendants trapped inside of it. People who look into the mirror ever since have reported feeling a sense of dread that stays with them past their visit, you know, experiencing horrid thoughts and more. Look, I want Team Smash the thing, even though I know that would technically make the world worse. So maybe just stick it in a closet somewhere, because it's just wrecked. Cause it's just messing with every other family. Number eight, Annabelle. Am I biased because Annabelle has always been my favorite demonic artifact? Absolutely I am. Donna and Angie were student nurses and good friends who had decided to room together while in school. And for Donna's 28th birthday, her mom had gifted her a very large Riggedy Ann doll, something she was thrilled about. Hey, personally, I'd react the same way. Let the record know that I'm always down to accept gifts of dolls or plushies. Soon after adopting the precious doll though, Donna started to notice some weird behavior. She would leave Annabelle on her bed every morning behind her locked bedroom door, seeing her the same way with her arms and legs crossed, and would come home at night to Annabelle having moved rooms and in positions that um, weren't possible. She's described a few instances of the doll kneeling, and speaking from experience, stuffed dolls can't kneel without falling for more than like a few seconds. Donna and Angie then started finding notes left throughout the apartment, written on parchment paper in red pen, two things they um, didn't own. When Donna's boyfriend Lou started criticizing the doll, unexplainable handprints and scratches began appearing on his body. And that's when the girls made the decision to call the priest, who then brought in Ed and Lorraine Warren. They were able to calm down the entity enough to remove it from the home and transport her to the museum, where she resides to this day, but not without a couple of um, chaos events over the years. Number seven, Robert the Evil Doll. Hey, for starters, this doll only looks vaguely human. His nub of a nose looks like a pair of pinholes, and he's covered in brown little nicks, like scars. His eyes are beady and black, and combined with his malevolent and smirk, it's terrifying to look at. Clasped in his lap, he's holding his own toy, a dog with disproportionate eyes and a too big tongue falling out of its mouth. The doll originally belonged to Robert Eugene Otto, an artist described as, well, eccentric. Neighbors of Robert used to hear him having a conversation with the doll, and this continued into his adult years. He brought it everywhere, and talked about it in the first person as if it weren't a doll, which I know, might sound kind of batty but it's the best way to deal with cursed objects. Trust me, I'm talking from experience. The doll remained stored in the Otto family home until Robert passed away in 1974. After his death, a couple bought the house and their eight-year-old found the doll in the attic. The young girl often claimed that the doll was trying to kill her and it's now on display in a museum in Key West and is still believed to curse people. His last caretaker before the museum experienced him disappear and reappear as he pleased, along with hearing footsteps and giggling in the attic. Some claimed Robert's expression changed when anybody badmouthed Otto in his presence. Oh, and um, he's been responsible for a few car crashes, some divorces, and broken bones. So, uh, good Robert, good doll, please. I don't need to be cursed. My life's crazy enough as it is. Number six, Dorothea Helen Puente. Dorothea Helen Puente was an American convicted serial killer, and in the 1980s, she ran a boarding house in Sacramento, California, and murdered various elderly and mentally disabled boarders before cashing their social security checks. She paid each of them monthly spendies, but then kept the remaining for what she claimed were expenses for the boarding house. Puente's boarding house was visited by several parole agents as a result of previous orders for her to stay away from the elderly people and not to handle government checks. Despite these frequent visits, she was never charged with anything. Neighbors began to grow suspicious of Puente when she said that she adopted a homeless man uh, named Chief to serve as a handyman. She had Chief dig the basement and remove soil and garbage from the property, and Chief then put in a newly concrete slab in the basement before he too mysteriously disappeared. In November 1988, another tenant in Puente's house, Alvaro Montoya, disappeared, and after he failed to show up for his meetings, his social worker reported him missing. Police arrived at Puente's boarding house and began to search the property. They discovered recently disturbed soil and were able to uncover over seven bodies in the yard. When the investigation began, Puente was not considered a suspect, and as soon as the police let her out of their sight, she basically fled to Los Angeles where she visited a bar and began to talk to an elderly pensioner. The man recognized her from the news and then he called the police and she was charged with nine counts of murder and was sentenced to two years of life. She died at the age of 82 and had always insisted all of her tenants died to natural death. Number five, Julia Tofana. Not your typical Chanel number five, but this too was a femme fatale bottle used by so many women to do one major thing, to get rid of their husbands. By some definitions, Julia was a girl's girl. After all, it was the 1600s, and women who had malignant husbands who would physically harm and control them was a rather common issue, and the general rule was that unless your spouse passed away, that was the only time a woman could be granted her freedom. In its creation was associated by none other than Julia Tofana, who apparently was the ringleader of six poisoners in Rome. In order to avoid detection from authorities, they actually used the trade name after St. Nicholas and would sell the poison openly as a cosmetic. They even went ahead and used an image of St. Nicholas over the vials and St. Nicholas and the vial of poison would be sold affecting over 600 victims, mostly husbands. The active contents inside the vial was unknown, but it was filled with arsenic, lead, and possibly belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and therefore very easy to mix with other substances like wine or water. The poisoning would go unnoticed and its symptoms would mimic other illnesses that was prominent at the time. First dosage would mimic a cold, the third would be digestive issues, and the fourth was death. It was so effective 
effective and helpful that when the poison was used to be in its slow active state, it would give the victims time to assume that they were dying and write a will. And if the provider of the poison changed their mind, an antidote was simply lemon juice and vinegar. Fun fact, Mozart at one point was poisoned using aqua tofana, but apparently he himself started this rumor. And if you knew anything about Mozart, he was the Bugs Bunny level type of troll. Number four, Bonnie Nettles. As cult leaders go, most women of cult leaders were subject to follow their male counterparts. As for Bonnie Nettles, she was the co-founder and co-leader with Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate New Religious Movement. Although she was registered as a nurse and was married to a businessman named Joseph Nettles, she actually lived a relatively normal life. However, according to the New York Times, she began attempting to contact deceased spirits by conducting regular seances and came to believe that the 19th century monk named Brother Francis frequently spoke with her and gave her instructions. She also visited multiple fortune tellers who told her that she would soon meet a mysterious man who was tall with light hair and fair complexion, descriptions that were very close to Marshall Applewhite's appearance. It was unclear how they met, but after Nettles did an astrological reading for Applewhite, they had an instant spiritual connection. Nettles and Applewhite established Heaven's Gate together as equals, with Nettles running the group and Applewhite speaking for her. Nettles claimed to have communicated with aliens about the next level and told Applewhite to tell their followers. When Nettles died from cancer, the mass followers of Heaven's Gates would then follow through by cultivating to take their own lives in 1997. Number three, Eileen Wernos. On a bit recent note, you may or may not have heard in this case in the news, but Eileen Wernos was a convicted serial killer as she targeted only men as an adult worker. She had up to seven victims and would target specifically motorists, men who she would meet as a hitchhiker. Her story begins when her mother at the age of 14 married her father at the age of 19. After two months of having Eileen, her parents divorced and left her with her alcoholic grandparents who were also malicious in their care. Eileen would then do adult work as a minor once her grandfather kicked her out to live in the woods at the age of 15 and she tried to take her own life multiple times, all failed attempts, and until she met the love of her life, Tyra Moore, in the late 80s is when she would continue a string of crime. While she was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections BCI death row for women, she tried to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was later denied, and at that point, she dismissed her legal counsel and terminated all pending appeals. She would then go off and say, I killed those men, I robbed them cold as ice, and I'd do it again too. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything, because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. I'm so sick of this she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. Times, I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. After extreme mistreatments she suffered while imprisoned and the inhuman management given to her by her officers, in her final interview, she turned to the interviewer and said, and also paraphrasing due to censorship, you sabotaged me, society, and the cops and the system. An attacked woman got executed and was used for books and movies and so on. Her final on-camera words were, thanks a lot, society, for railroading my ass. She was later executed by lethal injection. Number two, Pearl Fernandez. Again, although this case is one of a very recent event, it still marks as a notable case in the issues that lie in the legal forms, in the protections of minors, and the lack of involvement of CPS. Pearl Fernandez, you may or may not know, was the mother of Gabriel Fernandez, who passed away in Pearl and her boyfriend Usaro's custody. According to The Atlantic, Pearl Fernandez and her boyfriend shot Gabriel with a BB gun, tortured him with pepper spray, beat him with a baseball bat, and forced him to eat cat feces. All injuries pointed to severe psychological and emotional distress endured over a long period of time. It was not one time event that led to Gabriel's death, it was months of torture. A judge rejected her remorse, stating that Pearl's actions were horrendous and inhumane and nothing short of evil. At her trial, jurors heard how Gabriel was tortured and abused by his mother and her boyfriend after being placed in their care eight months before his death. Pearl is now serving time at the Central California Women's Facility after being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Number one, Jolly Jane. While she definitely was jolly when she committed these crimes, Jane Toppin, nicknamed Jolly Jane, was an American serial killer who was known to have committed 12 murders in Massachusetts between 18 and 1901. How did she commit these? Well, she was a nurse, and her objective was oddly enough to target patients and their family members. Doctors who hired her thought of her as one of their best nurses, but today psychiatrists say that she was one of the most unusual serial killers in history. She was born and raised in the Boston Female Asylum, where unwanted female children were often abandoned. There she was adopted by Anne Toppin, where she was under foster care until she was 18. At this point, she then pursued nursing at Cambridge Hospital in Boston. It was here where she stated her interest in the patients was ought to be taken care of. She grew emotional attachments to them and if she really liked them she would fake their medical documents to force them to stay longer at the hospital she would then also dose her elderly patients with opium to see how they react with the drugs and then upping the dosage each time she would also watch them slowly succumb to their death and she would also mix different types of poisons with her patients and other drugs to stage a sickness and nurse them back to health very similar to the gypsy rose blanchard case where her mother Dee had a mental illness known as munch austin syndrome by proxy this mental health condition is basically where a caregiver makes up or causes an illness or injury in a person under their care, such as the young or the elderly adult, or a person who has a disability. Because
because vulnerable people are the victims, MSBP is a form of multiple harm cases. Jolly Jane also had a masochistic side as she would even get into the bed of her patients who were suffering until they died. She wasn't caught until she used a metallic based poison on a victim which finally sparked an investigation in a court in 1902. Topan was found guilty and then she told her attorney that she actually killed more than 100 people and even got in beds with more of her victims. She was sentenced to stay at an asylum, stayed there until her death. I don't know about you, but I would be pretty annoyed if I had my royal court by my side 24-7. If you were an Egyptian monarch, most of your waking hours as a pharaoh would be constantly surrounded by people. The associates around you would include members of the royal court as many officials, family members, nobles, servants, and royal bodyguards would be included. From sunrise to sunset, you would never have a moment alone. Considering getting a position in the royal court, aside from on-hired craftsmanship jobs like architects, majority of the nobles that filled the ranks were the pharaoh friends and the relatives that were promoted into the these positions of court. So in some way, it was some type of nepotism that benefited you next to the king. Just like in the French monarchy before they ended up being cut off, the Queen Marie Antoinette would wake up with her servants at the foot of her bed ready to help her with her day. And that it, that does beg the question though, would you be also into that or no? Comment below. However, despite having your fam jan with you at all times, it still doesn't prevent the most obvious fear and that was family members challenging you for your throne and authority. Like majority of rich civilizations like the Romans, the British, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Chinese empire. And so many across the world alike all have the unfortunate circumstances of uprising in your own household. Like as an example with Japan and their empire, there's a theory that some say the emperors in ancient times, such as Emperor Sujin, Emperor Ojin, and Emperor Kitai, usurped the imperial throne regardless of the blood relations with the past emperors. And in ancient Egypt, the same saying goes with the other rulers like for Ramesses III, one of his wives had apparently orchestrated a rebellion on him so her own son would rule. And of course in England with Queen Elizabeth and her sister Queen Mary, both had conflict due to their father's many misbehaviors. But even as a royal with so many people tagging along beside you, from the moment you wake up to the moment you wipe your butt on the toilet or even going to bed, it does include what you wore. As a representative of your nation and your people, you had to be dressed to the nines at all times. In ancient Egypt, as an example, they took their wigs very seriously as they even also had a law that outlined those who could and could not wear them. Even according to their laws, it was illegal for slaves to wear wigs and if you were an elite member of the court or part of the royal family, you were most likely also going to have a quality wig compared to other people. Most royal wigs were the most elaborate and they would also include gold and silver and threads and even pharaohs would sometimes wear fake beards alongside their wigs for specialized events. And even with these specialized events, wearing fake beards might even suggest engagements. Like in some cultures, you'd have to ask permission to the family's head or in most cases the lady's father to court her or wed her and in some, this also includes the royal family aka the British royal family. According to the Royal Marriage Acts in 1772, British royal descendants don't have their liberty to exercise this right of love because they have to seek the monarchy's approval before the proposing. Queen Elizabeth II, when she was alive and well, all the other monarchs after her would also follow suit in the approval of every relations. Even the former Queen Elizabeth II had approved every union involving her children and grandchildren, including the one between Prince Andrew and Fergie and the one between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. She also extended her blessings approval for William's proposal to Middleton and Harry's request for Meghan Markle's hand in marriage. Also, I know it's now King Charles, I forgot. But aside, like all rules in regards to marriage just also involves the conversation of succession. In 1688, when it came to the British monarchs, James II fled England and the English parliament flexed his political muscle and offered the throne to James's daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange instead of his son. Since then, parliament has basically decided who is king or queen, but they use the same strict criteria. The new ruler must be descendants of the Princess Sophia, the Electress of Hanover and granddaughter of James I and a Protestant in communion with the Church of England who swears to preserve the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. Scotland. And because of the confliction of they had during the Roman Catholic Church due to King Henry VIII's excessive desire to have a son, Roman Catholics are expressively forbidden from ever ruling. The actual order of succession goes through Charles III's family and has been worked out down to the 23rd person, Queen Elizabeth's one-year-old great-grandson, Lucas Tyndall, who has to wait a while, I think. Number six, another Ouija board incident. The story of Mark and his family's eerie encounter with a cursed Ouija board infested home in Australia is nothing short of a supernatural roller coaster. At first, you know, subtle signs emerged, like their dog's reluctance to enter the house, which was dismissed as, you know, a mere adjustment to the new environment. But things quickly escalated. Mysterious flooding in the laundry room, shattered light bulbs, and an overwhelming sense of unease in certain areas of the house signaled something far more sinister. The disembodied laughter, shuffling feet, and phantom voices only intensified their torment. Even visiting relatives experienced the unnerving phenomena firsthand. What's truly chilling is the revelation about the previous renter's involvement in seances and a messy divorce, possibly leaving behind a trail of spiritual chaos. You know. Possibly. 
Maybe. Mark's mother's decision to consult a local pastor led to a grim revelation of multiple demonic entities lurking in their home. As the supernatural disturbances grew unbearable, the family decided to take action. The mom's brave confrontation with the paranormal, you know, reading Bible verses aloud, was met with the spirit's fury, resulting in potential poltergeist activity. The climax of this terrifying tale came when the youngest member of the family miraculously survived a fall from an open window. This event was the final straw, prompting them to flee the cursed house without looking back. Once again, not to sound like a broken record, leave Ouija boards alone. Please. Number 5. A Cursed Painting Technically this item cursed enough households to be a top 10 list of its own, which is a nightmare for my brain. The tale of the crying boy painting is a chilling example of the inexplicable, a bizarre intersection of art and the supernatural that unfolded in the 1970s and 1980s. Bob Smith's childhood fascination with the seemingly you know, innocent painting turned into a haunting mystery when a kitchen fire devastated his grandmother's house, leaving only the painting unscathed. The eerie connection deepened when Bob later learned that the very same painting had caused similar tragedies in other households. Giovanni Bregolin's series of paintings, of which the crime boy was a part, became notorious. In 1985, the Sun newspaper in the UK published a shocking account of May and Ron Hall, whose home was consumed by fire, with only the cursed painting surviving unharmed. What's truly unsettling is the firefighter's claim that he had witnessed multiple house fires where everything was reduced to ashes except for copies of The Crying Boy. The widespread reports of similar incidents fueled the belief in the painting's curse, leading to a wave of fear and destruction. Ultimately, the Sun's bonfire of these paintings marked the end of their popularity but a few copies still linger, carrying with them the ominous aura of the inexplicable. So um, if you have one, Burn it. Number 4. A Conjuring Book In this perplexing case, the Foster family found themselves entangled with quite the evil artifact. Yep, a book to conjure evil things that, uh, if you haven't guessed it already, brought malevolent forces into their home. The eerie events began when Lorraine Warren received a mysterious call from a Mrs. Sandy Foster in the middle of the night, only to have the phone connection mysteriously severed. The following day, Lorraine visited the Fosters and learned of the disturbing occurrences plaguing their household. Meg, the daughter, had unwittingly invited dark spirits by dabbling in the occult, and the family experienced a series of terrifying events. I'm talking the classic faucets turned on by themselves, phantom footsteps echoed throughout the house, and strange lights and sounds plagued their nights. So, go and Lorraine, they stepped in to confront the menacing presence. They discovered that Meg's bedroom was a hub of occult activities. They discovered that Meg's bedroom was quite the hub of occult activities, containing black conjuring candles, occult vestments, and ritual books. Ruh -ruh. They sealed the room, removing the sinister artifacts, and as they worked to dispel the evil, they encountered a chilling telepathic feeling of dread and an inexplicable force preventing them from ascending any kind of stairs. Despite these challenges, Ed and Lorraine persevered. With holy water and prayers, they successfully cleansed the house of the malevolent entities. The case serves as a haunting reminder of the dangers of dabbling in the occult and potential consequences of summoning forces beyond human comprehension. See? I told y'all. Don't summon beings. Number 3. The Snedeker Family Rosary Beads As you might have expected, this true story begins in the witching hour, in the wee small hours of the morning. One night, very very late at night, Ed and Lorraine were contacted by the family, who had just moved into a house on Meriden Avenue in Southington. Specifically, the mother of the family unit and a niece who came to stay with the family were on the phone. What they found and thought they bought was a big and seemingly welcoming home, but what they didn't know was that it was a former funeral home. Oh and fun fact, the morticians at the funeral home were allegedly involved in necrophilia, or performing um… Schmeck's acts with corpses. What used to be the showroom for the coffins was now the young person's room, you know, and uh, oh, just down the hall from that, the place where the bodies were prepared for viewing. So the young boys were the first to start talking about the things that they had seen and experienced, saying they were terrified, and the parents chastised them at first for it, but they were so scared they started sleeping on the floor in the living room. Among the sounds the boys would hear were the sound of uh, chains pulling the coffin upstairs. Only thing was, there was no more coffins. So the woman who called the Warrens were terrified, and with the niece in a small bedroom in the back of the house, and the covers on her bed were uh, levitating around her, like there was a fan blowing them around. You know, no big. And Lorraine said that while the mom was on the phone with her, even more bizarre events started happening. The mother had rosary beads in her hand, and while she spoke, the beads were actually being pulled apart and falling to the floor. So Ed and Lorraine went over the next morning with the family's parish priest. A blessing of the house seemed to do nothing to calm things down, so that's when the Warrens decided to call the bishop's office. Eventually sent an exorcist, which seemed to do the trick. But not before one last hurrah from whatever was believed to be haunting the house, because demons don't like to give up without a fight. There was a huge tree in front of the house, and half of the tree, with no wind, broke off and fell in the proper. The family moved a short time later, and Ed and Lorraine kept the rosary beads that had been pulled apart, because if a demonic spirit can touch a Catholic relic, that's just a really bad thing. Number 2. Bathsheba's Jewelry Box 
Soon after the Perron family moved into what they thought was a really fun home, strange occurrences began to unravel, initially dismissed as minor inconveniences. We're talking brooms moved on their own, and the young daughters started seeing apparitions. Carolyn Perron, determined to uncover the truth, delved into the history of the house and discovered a lineage plagued by mysterious and tragic deaths spanning eight generations. The most ominous presence was that of Bathsheba Sherman, a woman associated with witchcraft. Bathsheba's malevolent intentions became evident as the family's life spiraled into a nightmare. One harrowing incident involved Carolyn experiencing an inexplicable puncture wound on her calf, resembling a large sewing needle impalement. This unsettling occurrence was just one of the many tormenting episodes endured by the Perron family over their decade-long residency in the house. Thankfully, the Warrens got summoned to help the family, and they identified a cursed artifact, a mysterious box, which they believed acted as a conduit for the evil energy afflicting the household. So they took it with them. End of story. Thank goodness. Number one, don't open the box. In Jewish folklore, a dibuk is an evil spirit. Supposedly, a Holocaust survivor accidentally summoned the demon while using a homemade Ouija board, but managed to trap it inside a wine cabinet. Kevin Manis bought the box at an estate sale in 2001 and immediately started having nightmares about an evil hag. Ditto for the friends who stayed with him. He gave the box to his mom, who suffered a stroke on the same day, and later owners have also claimed that uh, the scary thing has appeared in their nightmares as well. Thankfully, at some point, the owner contacted local rabbis, sealed the demon back in the box, and then hid it from the world. Thank goodness. Number 10, bad boys. Starting off pretty late before we get into the nitty gritty, because if you know me, you know I love exposing horrible people. Anyways, let's start with Princess Beatrice. She was once in a very aggressively intense relationship with a man named Paolo Luzzo, who apparently was a bad boy. But not just a bad boy, he was convicted of many dangerous crimes while they were together. And although Princess Beatrice's own mother tried to diffuse attention, saying, We all have our own journey and we all have to learn our own way, and many friends include Paolo. Keep in mind, she was 17 years old when she got involved with the 24 year old, and as well, this 24 year old Paolo was also involved in the death of a teenager he was apparently on probation the whole time. In 2002, Paolo was charged with manslaughter death of a fellow student over a drunk fight. Either way, Paolo admitted that after they split up that he wasn't actually in love with Beatrice the whole time. He cheated on her so many times while they were dating. To be fair, Paolo did end up getting arrested in Australia in 2009 after he dined and dashed and crashed a rental Audi and he was found with two grams of coke and not the cola, the other one. As for Beatrice, she got married to a man from a noble family and got a kid now, so good for her. It makes sense when you're a royal monarch that when you travel, you travel well. After all, there's a lot of rules when it comes to being a person of ultimate power. Like how they can't travel in twos in the same family or they gotta have a funeral prep outfit just in case someone dies while they travel. As for other things, they even have to carry their own personal blood bag. According to the Telegraph, the former queen and her son, now King Charles, always brought a personal blood bag just in case he traveled in countries that lacked blood supply. And no, it wasn't for eating or eternal youth. I know some conspiracy theorists are enjoying this, but this was just in case of an emergency blood transfusion was essential. All you needed was a doctor on hand, which is why the Royal Navy doctor accompanies every royal on their trip just in case. Considering the royal family had a lot of members that done a lot of outrageous things, including involving themselves in German dictatorship dictatorship regimes in the Second World War, King George asked Britain's security services to put surveillance on his own brother Edward and his wife Wallace Simpson under the cognition of their sympathy for the regime. Even King Edward VIII, the former queen's uncle, was very close to his German cousins and their culture, which seems, of course, fine in that specific order, but a specific dictator did take over power in the 1920s and 1930s. Even Prince Philip had four sisters, all whom married German uh, aristocracy, and three out of four were sympathizers for the dictator regime. Despite being British rule, the bloodline is roughly made up of half of German uh, ancestors. Despite being the British rule, the bloodline is also roughly made up of uh, half German ancestors. Number seven, Prince Philip is gross. Considering he was the longest serving consort in the British monarchy, he was super racist and problematic. Prince Philip was known to have an aggressive, um, unprompted offensive remarks that's been noted for a really long time. And although at the age of 95 in 2017, the 40 years prior of his racist and degrading statements were always brushed off as meh, that's just Philip. And if you don't believe me, then again, why wouldn't you believe me? He is a British monarch whose family didn't disregard apartheid. He would say crazy things on a trip like in China. In 1986, he told British students if they stayed there longer, their eyes would become slit eyed. <sighs> With his whole chest, this man had the audacity to say so many insane things. Like, I don't think a prostitute is more moral than a wife, but they're doing the same thing. Told a 13 year old he should lose weight if he wants to be an astronaut, and told a 14 year old he looks like he's on. And he even asked a sea cadet if she worked at a I mean, yes, it seems like a very clearly early 2000 Comedy Central type of skit or something that one family member you have to warn other people to meet before a meeting would say. But for a British royal, it wasn't really much of a dark secret of him being the way that he was. But man, people need to stop acting like these people are great people. When they're just regular human beings just in positions of power, it's just because they got a lot of money. Heirs to the throne are not permitted to travel together. Traveling together for a family vacation is the most awaited times of our lives. But British royal families can't celebrate vacations together as according to the rules, no two heirs can travel together together to maintain the order of succession. However, when Prince William and his wife Kate Middleton had children, the prohibition was eased when Prince George turns 12.
2012, he will also have to start flying separately from his father. The Cambridges also frequently flown from their children in the past, but typically received special permission from the head of state to do so. It is also a rule that royals must always carry a black outfit while traveling, and reason being is in case there's an unexpected death in the family. This way, they can also be properly dressed to fit the somber occasion when they arrive back to the UK. This rule was created after the unexpected death of Queen Elizabeth's father, King George VI, as she was rushed home from Kenya and had to wait on a plane in London until someone brought her a change of clothes. According to Bustle, it also had been deemed inappropriate for Elizabeth to emerge in London in a normal dress after the death of the king, as well, although it's not officially a rule, traditionally royals are expected to wear black only during funerals. Generally, it is also thought black is not worn unless it's in mourning, although Princess Diana, Diana, Princess of Wales, did occasionally wear it for evening functions. The National Geographic documentary of Diana, in her own words, is narrated entirely by the late princess using rare audio recordings made by Diana in 1991. During one scene, Diana recalls a time Charles rebuked her for wearing a black dress during a royal engagement, and he commented she shouldn't wear it as black is only for the people who are in mourning, and she responded, Yes, but I'm not part of your family yet. Speaking of death, through when it came to the ancient Egyptians, if a family member died, specifically a pharaoh, so did everyone else. In ancient Egypt, they believed that when you passed away, your spiritual body continues into the afterlife, so to a place very similar to the living world, however, an entry to this ethereal paradise was not guaranteed. For he dead must venture on and negotiate a dangerous underworld journey and face a final judgement before they regained access. See, alongside the animals that were also mummified with their owners, even servants would be buried alongside them. It's a terrifying thought, though, that the possibility of your body boss dying, so you have to die with them. That way, they have someone to do the house chores around the afterlife still. Do you get extra pay though? I guess there's no point since we're both, you know, not around anymore. But this was also be more common, however, for the, for the pharaoh of Egypt, he did not want to go down alone. So yes, you do have to work for the king, but at what cost? Seems to be a very consistent theme in history. But even with the wives of the pharaohs, or wives in, of regular men, would also be buried with their partner, and since they too didn't want to linger in the afterlife alone, I mean, I guess, I mean, being alone isn't a bad thing, right? Even with death, came out a note of rumors and cover-ups. Apparently, in some rumors that King George V didn't die peacefully, but was actually comatose, but because he couldn't rule, it was processed made by his physician to inject him with fatal doses of substance. Even the physician's confession, he wrote that he only did it so that the announcement could be beyond time for the morning papers instead of the evening ones. And considering the traditions of wiping out monarchs for the view of the public, the queen's first cousin had developments of disabilities that were shamefully hidden from the public and was assumed legally dead, when in fact this scandal exploded to the public that the royals just couldn't do that. Well, they could do that that to their own members. But the thing is, it wasn't the first time the royals did this, as as we know how progressive the world is now, I'm sure it wouldn't be the last. King George V, the same king who denied the Tsar of Russia his own cousin from amnesty from their own rebellion in Russia, he also tucked away his youngest child from the public because he suffered from epilepsy. And finally, one other odd tradition and more on the lighter side, I guess it is the Waterloo ceremony. Every year, the monarch celebrates the historic British victory of the Battle of Waterloo by having the Duke of Wellington pay rent. It was the first First Duke of Wellington who, on June 18, 1815, led British forces to victory against Napoleon, and so as a thank you, the Crown purchased a house in Hampshire for him. Eight Dukes later, the person holding this position still resides in that same house. On June 18th of every year, the Duke of Wellington commemorates the Waterloo victory by paying a rent for the house, but it's not money, it's just purely a symbolic transaction because these people don't pay rent, they don't pay taxes either. During which the Duke gives the Queen a silk embroidered French flag. In the guard chamber at Windsor Castle, the flag is is draped over a bust of the Duke of Wellington. Number 10, Mary the First. So this is a ruler who could have reserved a place in common history as the first woman ever to be, you know, the Queen of England. Instead, she is mostly remembered as B-L-O-O-D-Y Mary, a name she acquired because of her staunch and violent opposition to the Reformation. Look, the interwebs don't like the B word, so I had to spell it out. So I'm hoping you figured out what I was trying to say. The most controversial part of her reign was her religious policy. Despite promises a month into her rise to the throne that she would not pursue forced conversion of Protestants, Mary had leading Protestant churchmen imprisoned. She sought to reaffirm papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the Heresy Acts were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. This sent a wave of fear through England, and around 800 Protestant nobles immediately fled the country. I wonder why. In February of 1555, well, um, the uh, executions began. Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was forced to watch the bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake. Cranmer repented his Protestant faith and technically, under law, he should have been absolved as a repentant, but Mary refused to accept his absolution and had him burned at the stake as well just to, you know, 
Set an example, or for funsies. By the end of her terror, Mary had almost 300 people executed, most of them by burning at the stake simply for the crime of being protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years, since she passed in 1558 from either ovarian cysts or ovarian cancer and was succeeded by Elizabeth I. Number 9. Wu Zetian Look, I know it's in the title of today that I'd be talking about evil queens, but I support all women's wrongs. And rulers in other countries tend to have different titles to their equivalent of queens. So Wu was born to a relatively wealthy family and had extremely progressive parents, becoming well versed in a wide range of subjects including writing, music, literature, and perhaps most importantly, politics and governmental affairs. By the age of 14, Wu was summoned to the imperial palace to become a concubine of Emperor Taizong. After his passing, the newly anointed Emperor Li Zi, the youngest son of the late emperor, who became Emperor Gaozong, brought Wu to the imperial court to be his own concubine. I'm not going to unpack that. In 654, Wu bore a daughter, but shortly after the birth, it passed, with evidence showing um, strangulation. So Wu accused Empress Wang of the death, and Wang lost favor with the emperor. The most popular theory is that Wu actually uh, did the act to her own daughter. So thereafter, the emperor conferred with his chancellors and despite opposition, demoted Wang, having her imprisoned, and promoted Wu to empress. Later on, the emperor considered having Wang released, but Wu had her executed upon hearing this, because you know, can't have any witnesses. Upon her accession to the throne, Wu began targeting officials who had opposed her rise to power, having them arrested and imprisoned, exiled, forced to take their own lives, or executed. In 664, she accused several officials of witchcraft and had them uh, executed as well, and their families became slaves within the imperial palace. In another incident, she killed her niece with poison, accused two others of the death, and executed them. She eventually passed after repeated bouts with illness, so nothing nefarious there. Number 8. Isabella of Castile So when Isabella was born on the 22nd of April in 1451, there was little chance she would ever become monarch of Castile, as she was very far removed from the direct royal lineage. War, politics, and subterfuge intervened, however, and for many years, the Kingdom of Spain was in turmoil, suffering from civil wars and uh, a lot of chaos. To quell one of the rebellions, the hand of Isabella was promised to the commoner, Pedro Duran Acuna Pacheco, but on his way to her, he suddenly fell ill and, um, passed. Now, this immensely fortuitous event for Isabella cemented her devotion to her faith, since she didn't exactly want to marry a commoner and prayed for divine intervention. Her marriage to Ferdinand, heir to the thrones of Castile and Aragon, cemented her future power. After the death of the King of Castile, the throne was given to Isabella. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians, which led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and torture of mostly Jewish and Muslim folks. Isabella waged war on the Kingdom of Granada, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last piece to fall in the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as the liberation of Spain, for many others it was open genocide. By the time Granada was annexed, 100,000 Muslims were either dead or enslaved. Number 7. Catherine de' Medici I'm chuckling, but I'm glad my obsession with rain in high school is about to come in handy. So serving as the Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, Catherine had enormous political sway over her sons, the French kings Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. They reigned through the French wars of religion and faced problems with a group of Calvinist Protestants called the Huguenots. It is widely believed by historians that Catherine attempted to have their leader, Gaspard II de Calais, Ligny assassinated. The attempt failed, and fearing retaliation from the most powerful folks in power, Catherine planned to kill them all before they could take action. The result was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which resulted in the deaths of between, oh, 5,000 to 30,000 Huguenots. And number six, taxes. Speaking of money, you know when they say eat the rich, I think aside the rhetoric of it being a human eating another human, I think it's more or less on the fact that there is so much damn money going to rich people that they continuously find justifications to avoid taxes. Meanwhile, the average hardworking person struggles daily to make ends meet under a minimum wage while also dealing with the cost of living, including food, rent, commuting, and overall expenses increases. Not to mention, if you're a student trying to go to school, I can't imagine the tuition. As of 2023 in the UK, the national living wage is roughly 10 to 11 pounds per hour, but the, re but the price of rent average to the UK according to the Home Light Rental Index is about £1,283. So why am I mentioning this? Well that's because the royal family earns as of notive of May 2023 an annual taxpayer funded payment known as the Sovereign Grant of £86.3 billion. Pounds. Sorry, that's too much. <laughs> Of eight of 86.3 million pounds. Oh my gosh, can you imagine if it was billion? According to Norman Baker, a politician and author of What the Royal Family Doesn't Want You to Know, mentions the cost are twice as any other monarch in Europe. 
And in quote, that is a grotesque underestimate because there are a number of benefits to the royal family which aren't available to other monarchs in Europe. And even with King Charles now in position, apparently the goal in 2025, the king's public funding will increase to a projected 38.5 million pounds, and by 2026, 126 million. So where does this money all go? Apparently to public safety, the police, and of course the maintenance of the royal head. But that's a lot of money. And as of Norman said, twice as any other monarch in Europe. And while the average British citizen are having difficulty putting food on the table, at least the King Charles can have time of his life with concert Queen Camilla mocking Canadian indigenous Inuit people performing throat singing. Number five, sorry cousin, I didn't mean to say this. Well, I meant to say this. This family is absolutely ridiculous when it comes to their treatment of others, especially each other. I mean, I'm surprised they lasted this long. I mean, do they even love each other? Or are even they, or, or are they even allowed to? Either way, they definitely showed love when they denied family members asylum. And by that, I mean King George V denied his cousin Tsar Nicholas II and his family. And if you know the story of Anastasia, you know the massacre that occurred. Tsar Nicholas II requested asylum in Britain for himself and his family, but he was denied. King George worried the rise of political tension in his own country, which to be honest, in a political standpoint, it makes sense as it was during a time where there was a lot of tension after the First World War, and the financial means was floundering due to taxes as well as the loss of life. And considering the two was very close, I can't imagine the heartbreak for the Tsar Nicholas to have his own favorite cousin say no. And in the end, we do know how the history played out for the Romanov family. Number four, hidden families. Speaking of families that the British family seems to not do much about, if you ever watched The Crown and you know that in season four, again, spoilers, or not spoilers, you can literally Google this. Anyways, it's true that the Queen's first cousins had development disabilities and were shamefully hidden from the public and was assumed legally dead, when in fact the scandal exploded in the public that the royals could do that to their own family members. But the thing is, this wasn't the first time the royals did this, and I know how progressive the world is now, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be the last. King George V, the same king who denied the Tsar of Russia, his own cousin, he actually stowed away his own youngest child from the public view because he suffered from epilepsy. According to the royal biographer Christopher Wilson, he noted that when it comes to family trees, it feels like if they feel like someone wasn't in the top notch level they can present to the public in a way that indicates the crown is unshakable or unhealthy, they can just write them out of the history books and no one would know. Like Prince John, the moment he died, no one heard anything about him ever since. Number three, Prince Andrew is disgusting. It's no surprise when it comes to powerful people, they do the most outlandish crap because they got money to do so. And when it comes to Prince Andrew, who by the way is the father of Princess Beatrice, the one who I mentioned earlier dating a convict, Prince Andrew had a lot of scandals, especially his involvement with the convicted offender Jeffrey Epstein. Considering there was a lot of illegal involvement in trafficking, including the violent, non-consensual involvement with a 17-year-old girl, it's because he was a prince and a powerful man and was able to do so, which is why he was able to commit to these crimes undercover. But once the news got wind, it turned into a whole hurricane. The royal general's response to his involvement in Epstein's scandal should go down as a lesson in what not to do in a PR crisis situation. Following the bumbling interview, Prince Andrew announced that he would step down the public duties for the foreseeable future, reportedly because his mother, the queen, told him to do so. The prince had also been stripped of his military titles and is no longer allowed to use the phrase His Royal Highness in official capacity as the change took place the day after the case was allowed to go forward in January. Number two, Princess Diana. Can't talk about the royal family without talking about the lovely Princess Diana. And if you grew up with an immigrant household, I bet your mom loved Princess Diana. Or in general, because a lot of women and moms in general loved Princess Diana, as she was known as the people's princess. She had no shame showing her love to the people, unlike the royal family, who was always forced to be reserved away from the public view. But Diana didn't give a dang and loved her as hard as much as she could. But sadly, she did suffer a great deal of depression and anxiety along the way. And considering she has an incompetent husband who had an obsession being a, can uh, being a tampon for Camilla, yes, you can look that up. It was a very weird phone call he had with her. I can't believe Diana dealt with that, and for what? Well, for her kids. But in association with her depression and suffering from eating disorders, she actually apparently threw herself down some stairs while she was pregnant. Now, she was struggling to get Charles to pay attention and give her the affirmation she needed, and considering she was struggling, not just as a married royal who was also aggressively in the public eye, she was struggling to be even noticed as a human being in the palace. So she admitted she threw herself down the stairs. Charles didn't budge though, as he didn't care as he went around horseback riding. And before some people think she was being dramatic, as someone who's certified in suicide prevention, I can tell you the signs were there. In fact, I have close friends who were also pregnant fall to this level of graphic depression to the point we had to ensure emergency safety to them and watch them as in order to make sure that they survived. So again, if you need someone to talk to or need help, just know there's always someone out there. Domestic violence is a real thing and no one should go through that alone. Number one, apartheid. It's no secret that the British were involved during a time of apartheid. I mean, my God, it's the British. Colonization? Nah, so many. English in general is the most dominating language in the world, so it makes abundantly clear who's been going around conquering everybody. The apartheid regime brought soon a lot of tension to the royal relations after 1947, members of the royal family avoided South Africa despite the queen being sovereign until 1961. And although the former Queen Elizabeth tried to forge a close relationship with the late South African leader Nelson Mandela, when she died, South African's Marxist opposition party, the Economic Freedom
freedom fighters said, We do not mourn the death of Elizabeth. They quote, Our interaction with Britain has been one of pain, death, and disposition, and of dehumanization of the African people. It said, Listing atrocities committed by the British forces in the late 19th and early 20th century, and the pain that lasted because of apartheid still lingers. But the revolution and constant upheaval from that struggle is why South Africa still remains strong despite its traumatizing history. After all, there are so many right now that have been infected by the British royal family's involvement in countries that they shouldn't uh, touch at all. Like India, Palestine, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, Asia in general, North America, there's a lot of countries. Okay.